on. And up first, we have Offside versus SSLD. And we kick things off with Firefly versus Tutoring in a PvZ, followed by a mirror matchup ZVZ between Rex and Silky. And at the end of the night, we have Uwu Thermal versus Espar in a random versus Terran. Oh boy. Here we go. The best of seven is upon us. As a reminder, this best of seven is comprised of best of twos. And this is a bittersweet matchup because this is a Firefly, the ace player of Offside, now going up against the Starving Camels, his old team. His old team full of friends that he knows near and dear. I do know that they still keep in touch, even though they're not on the same team anymore. So, oh boy, it's a bit of a blast from the past here as game one is going to be taking place on Ghost River. Oh boy. Our PVZ is upon us. And if you're in the chat, predictions will soon be open. Predictions are now open as you can place your bets on who you believe will take this series. It's going to be a best of two. So we can go 2-0 either direction or a 1-1 tied score. Up to you to decide the fate of these players or to guess the fate of these players <laughs> as we're getting ready here for game number one again ghost river is very much so a rush map a very short rush distance by ground you can be very aggressive very assertive we've seen a lot of all lins on this map we've seen them win we've seen them succeed and we've also seen them fail i imagine that tune is going to be on top of that i imagine tune wants to try to come out swinging it's going to be on tune to lead the charge here for his team but it's going to be a tough one, again, as Firefly, I would say, is the ace player of his team. Oh boy, we do see Offside coming out swinging here, and we'll see if the Starving Camels can swing back. Because it's the best of two, if you're curious how this format does work, the first map is predetermined, is chosen by the organizers and admins ahead of time. Um, the players, when they are chosen, when the roster, when the lineup is chosen, I should mention, they don't know the maps then. It's after the lineups are submitted, after the lineups are set in stone, then the starting map, the starting map is revealed to the teams. From here, it's going to be loser's pick. It's going to be loser's pick here, so whether Firefly takes a loss or Tudming, they will be able to bounce back in a prepared map for a prepared match. That is why this best of two format, we see very often upsets because the underdog can always come in prepared ahead of time. They can spend a uh, couple of days, once they know what the lineup is, they can spend a couple of days kind of trying to figure out what build they want to whip out on what map. And here we go spawning in the top right hand corner, we have Firefly for offside. And in the top left, we have Tudming. For the starving camels here we go but yeah this kind of format does favor preparation and just because you can whip out a map and blindside your opponent with a specialized build um that's why we've seen some really big pop-offs here with lesser players taking down some bigger teams but here we go as we get into game number one a big shout out to eva God, Bobby God, thank you so much for the raid. Hope you, I hope you had a great stream. Hope you had a great ladder session. Fun fact, we raided Eva and Eva raided us. Oh, the, the circle of life, Bobby, the circle of life. Hope you had a great time. I know Eva, he was laddering as his main race. He was laddering Protoss. Um, so hope you were able to, uh, to get some ladder points. Do well. Hope you had a good time. Hope you enjoyed yourself. It's the biggest thing. And get that going with us. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the beginning of day five of World Team League Code A. And here we go. We do have Tudming going for a hatch first. Just for now, going for a hatch gas pool. Standard opener here out of Tudming. And important to bear that in mind because I was expecting something more aggressive. And we could still see aggression out of Tudming as we load into Ghost River. For now, Firefly is being an anno as annoying as possible. He was forced to cancel and replace his pylon. So a bit of a shaky start out of Firefly. Not the biggest of deals, but it is an inefficient start here from him. As Firefly is going for a gate expand into his Cybercore. You know, the probe will get the hell out of there. It does confirm the standard opener of the Zerg player. We'll race back home. And we're settling into game number one. I destroyed Strange. Oh, in PvP? You're an animal, Bap. You're an animal. It's the Protoss player. Shaking my head. Shaking my head. Re-raid. Yes, yes. And welcome everyone else in the chat as well. Shout out to... I see Jade off. I see... Uh, Kuro, aka Sixteen Quads and Seki. Uh, Sounder, Wormshake, Jendabre, Jendabre. I saw Night Phoenix as well. Hello, welcome. Hope you're doing well. Um, congratulations, Night Phoenix, by the way. I did see that you joined a new team. Did join a new team. And I hope they treat you well. Hope you are reinvigorated when it comes to competing in StarCraft and in Stormgate. Wish you the best. Wish you the best. And of course, I stand as he was, uh, as he did come first, as he usually does. <laughs> Meanwhile, we're going to be settling into our game. But now we have our probe active on the map, trying to get a read on how many lings that do pop out. 
Trying to get a read on any kind of aggression from Toonming. Adept has arrived. Behind this, we have our tech of choice. It's going to be a Stargate opener here out of Firefly. With that Stargate, should be leading into Oracle base play. Should be leading into a third base as well. And as we get into this, a big shout out as well to Divinessia TV. Oh my god. Thank you so much for the raid. Hope you had a great stream. Hope you had a great cast. Uh, shout out to Divinessia as they are a Finnish caster or a fishing casting team. So uh, thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed yourself. Hope you had a great time. And welcome everyone to the World Team League. Welcome. Uh, Doria, papi. Doria. <laughs> As uh, for now, we do have a lair, very fast lair out of Toonming. Oh my god, that was what a three minute lair timing. Uh, with this lair timing, of course, we can head in a couple of different directions. This could be for a Link Queen Nidusol Lin. It could be for maybe a Link Flood with Drop Lords as well. It is possible. We'll keep an eye on him as Firefly does shade into the main base, does scout, does confirm the timing of the lair. Firefly now knows that something is amiss, something is wrong, and we'll piece together what exactly this is going to be. Only one gas has been taken, only one gas to work with. We're still making links, still making queens. I'm feeling some night display, but we'll see, as Toonming does have an Overlord poised to go into the main. You can see there on the minimap, there is an Overlord headed into the main base for a potential Nidus. And there it is, that Nidus Storm has been thrown down, as we did mention, with that faster lair. This is the only thing it could be, or one of the only things it could be. The other thing is potentially, you know, drop a Lord play. As you Thermal has been quite fond of that. Oracle is going to be dipping into the main. We have not gotten eyes on the Infestation bit yet. Sorry, on the Nidus Worm yet. But again, Firefly can piece it together. I'm sure this is in the back of his mind as a possibility of what it could be. And the Oracle does confirm the Nidus Worm. Big scout there from Firefly. Lings, they get across the map. They're going to be applying some pressure here to the third base. So far, good positioning out of Firefly. Doesn't lose too much. Doesn't lose anything, actually. And that's a lot of Lings in position. And here we go, Nidus Worm straight into the main base. It is spotted! It is going to be seen here by Firefly. At the same time, Lings are going to be hitting that third base, going for a surround on the Oracles. Sorry, on the Adepts. Well, the Oracles are there to support, and the Nidus is denied! Nidus Worm is going to be denied. One Adept goes down, and it looks like we will break this third base. Yeah, the Nidus Worm only had Queens inside. Lings, they break through the pylon, they break through the Adepts, and the third base is cancelled. So far, so good. I mean, that's a good pickup. Meanwhile, Toonming, he's still making 20 more lings behind this. He's still all in. He's still completely all in. Not turning back. Not turning around. Going for the gateway. And it looks like he will be able to focus it down. Good surface area here on that gateway. Shield is trying to keep it up and running. We have another Nidus Worm here behind the Gas Geysers. Overcharge is keeping the gateway alive. But the Nidus, it's going to finish. The Nidus Worm will complete. Queen's going to be popping out as well. Can we handle this? That's a lot of queens. That's a lot of queens, and that's a lot of lings that are coming their way, or making their way out as well. Overcharge was already spent on the gateway. Good positioning with the Stalkers. Very nice positioning. One Stalker goes down. But so little surface area on those Stalkers. Second Stalker falls, but we clean up every single ling. And you can see Firefly push on forward. The Shield Battery does finish, and he's focusing down that Nidus Worm. Ooh, no transfuse. It does not stay alive. And these queens... There's no way out. It's a one-way trip. Despite the transfusers, every queen here is going to be cleaned up. And even with another Nidus into the main base, what is there really even in that Nidus? GG gets called, and Firefly will take game number one. GG. A solid game number one there out of Firefly. Again, very good scout. He saw the lair very early on remember it was a three minute lair and he saw it around three minutes 20 three minutes 30 he saw it before it did complete with his adept shade upon seeing that he of course was rattling rattling, rattling off what it could be whether it's you know a link queen like drop a lord based all in or a nidus or if additional gases were being taken firefly did figure out what it was did get confirmation with the scouting of course did see the nidus swarming entirely and he was able to shut it down. And sure, the all-in did deny the third base. That's true. Third base was denied. But we were all-in. Denying a third is not good enough. Not with Toonmin continuing to bump out Ling's behind us. He had to kill his opponent. And Firefly was able to buy time. Able to pull back. Did not overcommit to the third base. And yeah, was able to have a cool, calm, and collected defense in that natural base. Even though the Night of Storm did finish in the natural, you saw... Firefly, not panic at all. Again, just pull back, make use of his, uh, make use of the terrain, make use of his building placement, the Sim City, and he was able to clean up all those links even without blink. Very well done, even without a shield battery overcharge, which is that much more impressive. GG, well played. <laughs> With that, Firefly does take the first game, and now it's going to be Tuming's map of choice. 
As a reminder, the way this format works is that it is loser's pick. So Jun Ming takes a loss, but he will be able to pick the map here to fight back, to bounce back, and I'm sure he's coming in prepared with a specialized build. Tudming versus Firefly, I don't expect a macro game from Tudming. I don't favor him in that position, but I do know he has a lot of all-ins up his sleeve, and oh my, we are going for post-youth. Let's go. Post-youth is going to be coming up as game number two, a very interesting map. Post-youth has a free hybrid brace, sorry, hybrid base in your main base. It also has a gold, and we have seen some Zerg players be brazen enough to take that gold as their natural. We have seen some Zerg players rush into that goal base very early on to take it as a natural, maybe even take it as their third base, but regardless, aggression is very possible on this map. Earlier today, we casted Dark in the KSL, and Dark was even able to pop off with his own, what was it, a four hatch before gas build on post youth. It was disgusting. It was crazy, and here we go. In the top right-hand corner, we have Firefly for offside. And in the bottom left, we have Tudming for the Starving Camels. Here we go. And really, my eyes are peeled on Tudming. What build do we go for? I'm looking at his minimap, he's going for the gold! If you look at the minimap, you can see his camera. He has set the location at the gold base, and he should be going for the gold as his natural. I, I, I'm, I'm zooming in. <laughs> Show us the drone, Papi. We'll see. We'll see if he does take it that early on. I'm sure it's in the back of his mind and no sorry he is not going to the gold he's going to his natural hybrid base first he did set his camera at that gold but it looks like he's not going for it as his natural oh meanwhile a shout out to the sponsors of course a shout out to the sponsors of wtl a shout out to doyu Biu Biu, autofool and tidal as well without our lovely sponsors this event could not be possible unfortunately a lot of the sponsors are based in china and if you're outside of china you can't really like make use of them or you can't really support them in, in any in many ways so uh, it is a bit of a shame when it comes to the international scene but regardless it's really cool to see the support that this event is getting really do appreciate it as Tudming is going hatch gas pool standard opener so far hatch gas pool we'll see when and if he does take the gold and how he does make use of it for now we do see firefly likewise going for a gate expand into cybercore so far everything is as it should be the biggest difference here is that post youth, of course, allows you to get your natural without too much issue. It's a hybrid base, so you have additional mineral income here as well, more than you normally would. And uh, your two base setup is very defendable. Very defendable two base setup here. Should be pretty safe and sound to any kind of early game aggression. Should be perfectly safe and sound. Here we go. We do have Firefly moving in with his probe. Is going to be scouting and is going to be being an annoyance tasing away at those drones disrupting some of the mining not able to do much else as the probe does get the hell out of there and i'm sure firefly wants to get eyes on any would-be third base at the standard third location or the gold as the probe it does try to dip back in Ooh, but it's going to be shut down by the lings the lings are going to get on top of it and we have our take of choice it's going to be a stargate opener from firefly everything looking just like game number one Nothing crazy, no big deviation from Firefly, no major tech switch. And on a map like Post Youth, I don't really expect too much of that. Again, this map is quite large, there's a lot of bases to be taken. I have attributed this map a little bit to last season's map, last me last season's Radis Station. It isn't as extreme as Radis Station when it comes to like how heavily fortified you can get on four bases. Um, or yeah, on four bases. So it's not that extreme as Tudming is making a wave of wings. Interesting. His third base has been thrown down at the standard third base location. He's not going into the gold. My eyes are definitely on Tudming here. I am intrigued as Lings are floating across the map as we speak. Ling speed still on the way. Tudming, he wants to deny that third base. I don't see him breaking into the natural, but he's still making Lings. He's he's just uh, it's a Ling flood straight up. He's cutting workers at 23. He has not made a single drone in quite some time. He's just flooding lanes across the map instead. There is no baneliness. Bear that in mind. Oh, will this work out? This hasn't been scattered at least. The Oracle moves out, and we do get eyes on the Lings, the, but the boys have been pulled! We're going for a drone drill! Oh my god! We can mine through the minerals. Again, there is a mineral wall on the left-hand side, and we can mine through them. We have a full wall behind this Oracle, behind this, uh, behind this Stalker even. 
We have a full wall. Oracle's going ham as well. I like the ingenuity here of bringing, the, of bringing those drones. But alas, they will not mine through. The wall is solid. And we focus out almost every single worker. Oh, we have two patches left. One more. The patch is going to be opening up, but we're running out of lings. There we go. We have an opening in that wall, but we have a full wall behind it. Firefly is looking solid. Lings are trying to break through. It is a full wall. And the Oracles are running out of energy. Let's go. They are out of energy. The pylon is going to be going down. Do we have another wall behind it? We do. Do you have another pylon? And if given enough time, these Oracles, they will be able to activate the Pulsar Beam once again. Another pylon falls. Clutch shield battery. Shield battery. Clutch force field. Would you save that pylon? But the gateway is going to fall. The Lings, they bust in. The Lings, they do barely break in. They're going to surround on the sentry. They're going to surround on the Adepts as well. And Tudming has he done it. The boys are being pulled, but the Adepts, they're going down. Has he done it? Probes are falling. We have the overcharge. Overcharge barely does pop. We keep the probes alive. Again, the Oracles, they still need more time. And the wall, I believe, is still open. We need to wall off. Yeah, the Oracles activate their beams. Adepts will clean up these Lings. We have another wave, wave coming in behind this. We do fully wall off in time. GG gets caught. Firefly, he does hold. And Firefly takes a 2-0 lead here. Takes down Tudming. 2-0. Whew. GG. And I have seen some players try this. This is not the first time we've seen uh, players, Zerg players, go for some kind of flood, go for some kind of all-in, and pull the boys to mine out those minerals. Unfortunately, it took a little bit too long. As we saw there, it's multiple layers of minerals at that wall, um, or it, it takes multiple rotations of drones, and uh, alas, it took a little bit too long to mine through that wall. Firefly was able to wall up just in time as well. Not just that, but Firefly was intentionally focusing down drones with his oracles, making sure that it did take as long as it did to mine through those minerals. And with that, Firefly does defend. But I'll be honest, I'm sure that at some point in the near future, we're going to see an all-in that works doing that. Where you bring workers and you mine through those minerals and you go for the all-in. Like, I, I, I want to believe that we're going to see that at some point. We haven't seen it yet, but at some point we will. Fingers crossed. <laughs> one day, papi, one day. Uh -huh. Until then, we're getting into our second series here. Our second best of two. It is going to be Rex versus Silky in a ZVZ. A strong start for offside, but again, Firefly is the strongest player on offside, so... He was expected to come in, swing in, come in with a 2-0 with a big win. Tudming almost caught him off guard, almost caught him with his pants down, unable to. But this is the moment where Silky can bounce back. Silky, I would say, is the strongest, currently the strongest player on the Starving Camels. With the loss of Firefly, with the loss of Cyan, Silky, he is going to have to take that mantle. And here we go in the top left-hand corner, we have Rex for offside. And in the bottom right, we have Silky for the starving camels. Silky, I would say the best Zerg player in all of China. He is the best player. And again, it's on Silky here to start to bounce back for his team. To start to fight back here. To give his team a chance to make it and qualify for Kodas. The pressure is on. The problem, of course, is that Rex is no slouch. Rex, he's the best Zerg player in all of Taiwan. He is the Kong, of course, himself. The king, even. And, uh, interesting. Rex is going for a pull first. Okay. We have a pull first opener here out of Rex. Very safe. With this, it should be a pull into hatchery, into gas. Meanwhile, Silky going for a hatch first. So, standard opener from Silky. And again, I imagine a safe opener out of Rex. As he's going to be joining up, joining up to 17. And there we go. Now he's going for the hatchery. Now, with this earlier spawning pool, I believe we should be banking up Larva and going for some Lings early on. Um, not too many. I'm imagining six at most. Uh, we're going to be moving out to try to harass, to try to pick up some workers, to try to gain a big, bit of an economic lead. And there it is. Six Lings are on the way. Behind this, we should be droning. It's going to be six Lings into drones, into a queen. And from here, I imagine Rex is going to be walling up on two bases and going two base roach. Uh, the gas is not too late, though. So the gas is going to be delayed for Rex. That's the reason why I assume that Rex is playing two base Roach because his gas is so late because uh, it's going to take a while for him to catch up when it comes to Ling speed and get into Ling Bane. As Ling's are scrolling around the edge, 
hoping to avoid the overlords. They do avoid the first one, but they do get eyes on, or they do get caught by the second. Silky does have eyes on those lings, and he should be evacuating his natural. Again, he has to be very careful, and he has to take this seriously. It's gone. It's on Rex right now to try to pick up some workers, and there we go. He does pull back, does evacuate, and based on the micro of Silky, it's on him to minimize his drone losses. Oh, so far, it doesn't lose any yet. So far, so good. Queen is on the way. You can see Rex trying to camp those eggs. Oh, and he gets a surround. Gets one. Gets one, gets two lings. Good catch. Does manage to get two lings. And again, he's going to be camping that area, hoping for some more damage. Oh, Omens gets another ling as well. Queen does arrive. Good positioning here in that mineral line. But two more lings go down. Very nice trades here from Rex. But he's finally going to be forced back. Oh, he goes for the dive on that drone. He wants it. Oh, it's close. And he does get a worker. Whew. And with that, Rex tays, he takes a worker lead. <laughs> we have 26 drones to the 23 of his opponent. Not a bad trade. You can see here, we traded six lings for six lings and one drone. So barely did out trade his opponent. And we spoke about it. Uh, Rex is walling up. He has an Evo Chamber on the way. Ooh, but he does have ling speed. Okay, very interesting. So what's happening right now, I believe, and we have, I could be wrong here, but I believe Rex, he's walling up and he's faking out Roach play and he should be going for a Ling Flood. Otherwise, there's not much reason to invest into Ling Speed, whereas that could otherwise be spent on Roaches instead. Plus one Carapace is on the way. Okay, never mind. This is looking like a more old school build. Um, if you remember, it was last year. It was last year, first half of 2023, where this Roach Ling All In kind of was quite prevalent in the meta in ZVZ. It did fall off eventually after, after like a good half a year of play. But um, it looks like we are making Lings, of course, but with plus one Carapace on the way, that does show us that we intend to go into Roaches behind it, that we do intend for a follow-up. Now, what's important here is that because Rex is walling up and because he's hiding these lings, again, he's faking out Roach play, and that means that Silky will not have a Bailey Nest. Silky, he will not have a Bailey Nest to defend. He assumes that his opponent is also skipping ling speed, which is what Silky has done, by the way. He has skipped it, and here we go. We're flooding lings across the map, and we should at least deny the third base. We could even do more than that. Now, Silky, he doesn't have ling speed. He doesn't have any Roaches. He has nothing to defend, only Queens and SimCity. And he does have a full wall. We're going for it. Okay, we're back. <laughs> I'm like, is he going to try and bust in? He gets a third. He gets a third for free. Again, this links or this Link Flood, what did catch Silky off guard, was unprepared for this. The hatchery will go down. Good pick off. Link's wall's open. The wall is open. We'll go for the Queens. Ah, but the Roaches, they come out just in time. The Queens are safe and Rex has to back off. And from here, we get into Roach v. Roach. But remember, because of plus one Carapace, that is an upgrade that does benefit both Lings and Roaches. And we could try to go for a Roach Ling timing behind it, but never mind. We have plus one range on the way. We're getting into a longer game. We're droning. We are droning up. We're getting into Roach v. Roach. Rex has the advantage of the faster third base as he's, his is about to finish. Silky's just now starting. And we'll keep an eye on Silky's drone count, because he's amassing roaches, and he may not stop. Silky, his hand may be forced. I mean, he's got an earlier plus one range timing. Is still making roaches. We do see Rex droning. Meanwhile, Silky is not. Uh-oh. No drones yet. Not inside here for Silky. Still amassing roaches. Yeah, overlords are on the way. Bit of a supply block for Silky, which is brutal. We have three overlords in production as a result. But I believe Silky shouldn't be droning from here. Thankfully, Rex doesn't drone up too much. He did make 45 workers as opposed to the 42. Ooh, Rex, he's making another wave of drones. That is dangerous. And here comes the all-in. Here comes a push here from Silky. And Rex, has he droned up too much? Or is he going to be able to hold on? He does have the ramp. Does have the high ground. He has a defender's advantage. Silky going to be forcing his way in. He does have the rich lead. Queens, they do come in to help support. We do. Oh, we do have a transfuse. We, did, we had one in the chamber. And Silky, can we break through? Reinforcements are coming in. Queens as well coming in to support. And Silky, he's being forced back. Rex, he holds. As Silky's forced back, he's droning. Rex, he got away with a better economy for longer there. And the game will progress. 
Whew, okay. <laughs> the game will progress from here. Let's go. Let us go. As Silky gonna be splitting up his forces, heading for heading for that natural. Does pull back. And we're kind of stabilizing here. Rex does have the upgraded advantage with plus one carapace, but in Roach v Roach, carapace is not the most impactful of upgrades, so it doesn't matter as much here. It is still a nice lead that he has. As from here, we're gonna be joining up. Silky joining up to 57, by the way. It's gonna be Rex's turn to all in. Rex, he has cut workers at 48. He has not made a single drone in quite some time. Ever since the initial defense. And Rex is going for a massive counter push. And he is up 20 supply. Uh-oh. He's up 20 army supply. He collapses on the army here of Silky. Remember that upgrade advantage as well. And Silky gets caught out with his pants down. Was not ready for this. Silky droned up too much. <laughs> made too many workers. Boys are being pulled. He can afford to lose them. Queens are coming into support as well. We're just flooding roaches across the map. And Rex, it looks like he has too much. He's breaking through. Yeah, too many reinforcements. Too many roaches. The queens are falling. And Rex, he's going to be extending the lead here for his team. Firefly did well in the first best of two. And Rex, he kicked things off once again with a win as well. Silky just cannot hold. He cannot defend. More boys being pulled. But it may just be too little too late. As the Roach army is just too much here from Rex. There are only a handful of Roaches left. GG gets called and Rex, he does bounce back. He does take game number one. Ooh, GG. <laughs> GG, well played. This was basically like a game of chicken here. Who drones, who doesn't? At what point do we cut workers? At what point do we stop making Roaches? And it was quite back and forth is what I will say. There were some moments for either player, but... um. In the end, or towards the end there, we saw that after the initial defense, Silky assumed that Rex was droning. Silky was wrong. That's kind of what it came down to. He just assumed that Rex would be droning and Rex would be going for a longer game. I had made that assumption as well. And then we noticed, hold up, Rex hasn't made a single drone in quite some time. And he just doubled down, went for like a two and a half base all in, did not saturate his third and did overwhelm his opponent. That's a scary thing here about ZVZ, that's something you have to always bear in mind, is, is your opponent droning or not? It's so important to get eyes on this, it's so important to get eyes on your opponent's third base saturation and your opponent's natural saturation as well. Um, oh, hello. <laughs> um, as, oh my god. Oh, we are just pointing out some of the openers here? Wait, what, what are we looking at? Who is this? Barcode Zerg. Five. Is. <laughs> Wait, what? I don't, I don't know what they're saying. No. I don't know, Papi. I don't know. Uh, this is not the game we just casted, by the way. But they are showing a ladder game. Okay. <laughs> they're looking at. Are all a part of Team Vitality. And uh, they have made a sister team called Offside. But here we go in the bottom right hand corner. We have for Offside, Rex. And in the top left, we have for the Starving Camels, Silky. Here we go. Uh, but yeah, Offside is a sister team here to Onside Gaming. And uh, yeah, it's really great to see them uh, support some other up and coming players. Rex, Euthermal, Firefly. Um... I think Control is on Offside as well. Uh, Gemini, potentially. I know Gemini is working on their social media team. Does work for them. So it is really cool to see that uh, even though Onside was acquired and even though Onside, you know, they, their their key players are, are doing well for themselves, they're still willing to support, you know, some of the more uh, up-and-coming players out there, not just the best of the best. So we do appreciate it. We do appreciate it. Part yeah, part true. Partnership, partnership. True, true, true. Not quite acquisition, partnership. Yes, yes. But we do appreciate it that, again, that despite, you know, despite the partnership with Team Vitality, they're still willing to, you know, support Rex, Firefly, and Euthermal. It's really cool. Really do appreciate it. Lot of love, lot of love from one side. As from here, we're getting into our Hatch Gas Pool. Standard openers so far. We did see some more quirky builds out of Rex in game one, but here, Hatch Gas Pool, standard play. Yeah, Control, Rex, Firefly, Gemini, and Euthermal. Yeah, exactly, exactly. 
really new up and comers. Maybe new up and comers isn't the best way, but uh, rising stars is maybe a better way to put it. Um, I think we can all get behind the hype that is Firefly. Like I'm, I'm a massive Firefly fan. After 2023, how could you, how could you not be? Um, I say this all the time, but I do think the Firefly is the rising star of 2023. Like he's like one of the, one of the most standout players there when it comes to the rate of improvement and uh, really just having a, a bombastic showing in WTL in general. Um, great guy, great player. I love to see a Firefly with Vitality to keep his run going. I mean, you say that, mate. What's the? It's too soon to say that, Bobby. What do you mean? No faith. No faith in offside to make it into code S? Shaking my head, Bobby. Shaking my head. I believe. I believe in the power of Firefly. Um, but I, I know that Tassad is also a really big Firefly fan. So getting into this at all. <laughs> Thank you so much for the $30 save. Gracias, Bobby. Gracias. Thank you so much. I believe that is uh, from the owner of Onside. Um, thank you. We do appreciate it. Come, Samnida. Come, Samnida. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, always do appreciate it. Again, all the money that we earn here on the channel goes towards the tournaments that we host and the tournaments that we run. So thank you so much. We actually just casted Sea Duckling Open, a bronze to diamond tournament. Just casted our diamond tournament earlier today. And uh, we're able to afford and we're able to fund those events thanks to the support that we get. So thank you. Thank you. As we are settling into this. Now, as we said, Lintus, I know that we weren't quite talking about the game, but it was just Hatch Gas Pool. Standard build so far from both players. We are getting into the Ling Bane phase of ZVZ. We skipped it in the previous game. We were trying to rush into Roach v Roach, but now the Ling Bane aggression is upon us. Third bases are being taken, and we'll see if Rex can hold on to that third because Silky is moving out. Silky is moving out here. Bailing has arrived. Rex not quite ready. His own Bailings are just around the corner. How good is the control going to be? Oh, that's first bailing. Does zone Rex away. Likewise, is able to zone away the lings of Silky. Queens are pushing forward. And the bailings are going to be focused down. Good control here by Rex. Does focus down the bailings. And no big connections on Rex's army. He saves his third base. He takes down three bailings. A very efficient trade from our blue Zerg player. Oof. Very nicely done. And with that, we are settling into Roach play. We're going to be droning up, getting into our Roach Warrens. I believe the Roach Warren is done for both players. Yeah, both Rex and Silky. We do have a bit of a Ling run by. We get the Queen. Oh, Queen is surrounded. Rex, uh, just a little bit out of position. Was out of position. Does get caught out. We're a little bit greedy. We try to go for a second Queen. But alas, it is kept safe. Is kept alive. So despite all the dead bailings, at least Silky is able to catch a Queen. So we have a bit of a give and take here. A bit of a back and forth. Roaches are amassing for both players. We see that Silky is joining up behind this, so is Rex, so we're working towards the mid game. We are making roaches, that is true, but we're not committing. As Silky's moving out, you can see here on the production tab, Silky is still droning. So it looks like he's posturing more than anything. I'm not so certain he really intends to commit. I say that he is morphing into mailings. He is rallying his army over. Likewise, Rex getting in position. That is getting set up. And there we go. You can see that Silky's droning. So it looks like Silky from here, he may just back off and go back home. This is a big part of ZVZ. Because Overlords are a resource, because Map Vision is a resource, you can use it against your opponent. As Silky is going to push on forward. At the same time, Rex going for a Ling run by. He does head over towards that third base. Meanwhile, Silky will pull back. And drones are going down. Silky out of position. Not ready for the run by. Six drones fall and we get into the natural base. There's no bailing to defend. We get on top of the queen. And Silky is racing back home. Remember, Silky did not intend to push in. He wasn't going to commit. He wasn't going to push. And now he's bleeding out back at home. He's racing back home as well. Did not have the army to actually commit. Oh, and Rex is snowballing out of control. 16 drones go down and we're not even done. There's too many links in the main base. There's too many links on the dance floor. Roaches are moving out as well. We catch out the roaches of Silky and it's all falling apart here. Ay, ay, ay. One wrong move and it can all be over. We can see Silky's able to hold on with his roach army, but the links ain't coming from behind. They collapse on, those, on these roaches. Very efficient trade here by Rex. And GG gets called. Rex will take down Silky 2-0. And Offside will advance on here into the next round. We'll take at least the 4-0.
GG, well played. A strong performance here out of offside so far. Firefly able to survive the cheese of Toonming. Rex able to catch Silky off guard more than once. Remember in game one, we saw a two and a half base all in out of Rex where he cut workers at 47 and Silky over droned. Here in game number two, Silky was just out of position. He was posturing with his main army as he was droning and he was caught with his pants down. He was caught with his pants down. The army was out on the map. Nothing at home to defend as he was droning. So no reinforcements. And that was just the beginning of the end. GG, well played. Whew. Rex takes the 2-0. But if you're a fan of StarCraft, if you're a fan of these teams, and if you want some more, Andrew, uh, but he's very inexperienced. A very inexperienced player. More of a ladder hero, under, uh, under my, in my understanding. He is more of a ladder hero. And uh, we'll see if he's able to keep up with the likes of Euthermal. Now, Euthermal is playing random and uh he is no longer a full-time pro player like he once was you know back in the day he was one of the best terran players outside of korea he um had his own had, he had his own time in the sun got his own championship wins as well a very impressive career by you thermal and nowadays he runs a very successful youtube channel very successful um i think his id in game is youtube man at he makes a lot of youtube content and it's pretty good it's pretty good it's pretty damn popular um but it's really cool to see that Euthermal, as of late, has come back to competing. Um, over the past couple of months, he's become more and more active in the ESL Open Cups, in WTL, in the qualifiers. I remember last season, I believe Euthermal was playing for Team Roddy. I think he was playing for Team Roddy in the qualifiers of, of the previous season of WTL. And uh, he's been very active. He's been much more active nowadays. Um, as was being mentioned in the chat he's not um at the level he once was like he's still really strong with his terran um but uh nowadays he plays random so it's a lot more up in the air it's a lot more difficult to predict here so best of luck when it comes to your predictions because you thermal his terran may be good but his protoss and zerg are much more up in the air whenever he plays zerg it's an all-in if you've tuned in recently, you would know that it's it's always an all-in if you ever roll Zerg. Protoss, he can play out the mid-game. We have seen him do that before, um, depending on the matchup. So his Protoss is a little bit more flexible. I would say his Protoss is his second strongest race. Of course, his Terran is where he's at his best. And here we go in the top right-hand corner. He's going to be rolling his Protoss. It is Euthermal for offside. And in the bottom left, we have his opponent. We have Espar for the Starving Cows. Let's go. He's a ladder hero like all of us. True, Bobby, true. He's a man of the people. Espar, let's go. Take us to Codex Arc. <laughs> to the moon, Bobby, to the moon. One step closer offside. One step closer here to Codex. Um, I mentioned before, we already have two teams confirmed for Codex. And from my understanding, we have four teams fighting for one spot. Four teams fighting for one lone spot for Codex. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy here for any of these teams. Wish them all the best here, as we will soon crown our three Codes qualifiers in the coming days. As we have rolled our Protoss, the YouTube man himself, he's coming out swinging here with a Protoss. Ah, let's go. <laughs> I think he's called YouTube man on NA, and I think he's called Protoss fan on Europe. He's called Protoss fan on Europe. I can't remember what he's called in Korea. But uh, let's go. <laughs> As Espoir, what I will say about our about our lovely up-and-coming uh, Chinese Terran player here is that there's a lot less pressure on him now. Uh, you know, the reality is that the Starving Camels, they have been knocked out of Code A. They cannot win this series. Um, and because that may be, that means that Espar can play without too much pressure on his shoulders. You know, there isn't uh, the t his tournament life on the line or anything like that. He can play his heart out now and focus on the game. It is going to be a Rax Expand. It was a single gas opener here from Espar. Just a single gas geyser. So a more economic build here from our Terran. Meanwhile, Euthermal back at home, soon to throw down his tech of choice. Cybercore is done, and we'll see if he goes for a Stargate, a Twilight Council, or a Robo. We shall see. And we have our answer. It is going to be the Stargate. Okay. 
Stargate opener out of Euthermal. Now, what I love out of Euthermal is, especially even with his Terran, I should emphasize, even with his Terran, Euthermal is a very unorthodox player. He can play standard with his Terran, and he can play standard with his Protoss as well. Don't get me wrong. He, he has it within him to play standard. But more often than not, he's a YouTube man, okay? He's a content man, and he likes to spice these up. He likes to win with style, is what I should say. You know, he has that kind of flair to him. So... We'll keep our eyes on you, Thermal. For now, everything looks standard. For now, everything looks normal. I'm just saying that I wouldn't be too surprised if he does kind of like throw in a bit of a twist there and does do something a little bit more unorthodox. For now, Oracle first. It is going to be an Oracle first out of you, Thermal. Going to be moving out across the map. We're going to harass. With this Oracle-based opener, that means that this might not be Phoenixes, as in we may just avoid Phoenixes entirely and transition into a Twilight Council instead. Reaper is going to dip in, and Esbar, he's going to get a full scout of the main base. He does get eyes on the Stargate and the Oracle. Esbar, he sees all, he knows all. He should be getting ready for that Oracle harass with Vikings and Cyclones back at home. Speaking of, there's a safety Cyclone in the main base. We have a handful of Marines as well split between the bases. And we are lying in wait, waiting for that as we throw down a second Stargate. And we continue Oracle production. Mass Oracle? Potentially. And this is what we spoke about. The opener was standard, but... If Euthermal can get away with it, he will. He does like to style a little bit. He does like to style on his opponents, if at all possible. Second Stargate's on the way. Do we keep making Oracles, or do we go into Phoenixes? Phoenixes would be a little bit more standard. Not, not quite standard, but a little bit more sane. That's a third Oracle. That's a third Oracle in production. Papi, are we going to double down? I think we are. Show us the Oracle. There it is. We're going Mass Oracle. We're massing Oracles, Papi. He knows how to win games. He knows the power of Protoss. Mate, just, just keep making Oracles. Do what Hero does. Fun fact, Hero has his own Mass Oracle build as well. Fun fact, though, Hero usually does Mass Oracle. I say Mass Oracle. It's like Oracle will charge the all-in on three bases. Uh, usually whips that out uh, against Zerg. Not quite against Terran. So I'm happy. I'm excited. We'll see if Espar can figure out what's going on. You know, winding it back here uh, to the perspective of, of the Terran player, Espar has yet to confirm the follow-up. He saw the initial Oracle, but that's all he's seen. He hasn't seen the main base to see what kind of follow-up tech there is. Doesn't know what's coming his way. Doesn't know about the mass Oracle. Stim is not done. Stim is not done. He's moving out as he moves out. The Oracles, they're moving in. The Oracles do move in. They wreak havoc. SCVs are going down. One after the other. Eight, nine, ten SCVs go down and counting. And even if there were Marines back at home, they don't have Stim. They cannot keep up. Not with these Oracles. Not with this many. As we are just going to town. And Esquire, he's forced all in. It's all or nothing. He does have two tanks. But time is working against him. He needs to go here and now. Cannot slow down. The longer this goes on, the better it is for you, Thermal. As we get 27 SCVs across the map, 29, 30 SCVs. Shield battery goes down. No overcharge. And we've got to keep pushing. We've got to keep going. Boys are being pulled. More Oracles have arrived. Stim is done for the Terran. Stim is complete. As you throw more supply blocks. Uh-oh. Big supply block here for you, Thermal. Another pylon going to be going down. You Thermal, he will not break out of this supply block. Not anytime soon. Unless he does throw away some units. There we go, Oracles. They come in from behind. They take down one of the tanks. Good pick off. And they're going for the other. Second tank is going to be targeted down. Only Marines. Only a Cyclone remaining. We are cutting our hearts out, but it looks like we just do not have enough. Espar gets forced back, and you Thermal holds. And he's on three bases. We have 40 workers against 17 SCVs. So the third start. We don't even need a third. We don't even need a third Stargate, but you know what? Why not? We throw it down anyway. And we are still committed to Mass Oracle, even against the Mass Demarine. Bold move here by Euthermal. But honestly, with enough Oracles, you can do anything. You can you can even shoot up. Copian. As the Viking has arrived. Phoenixes are now on the way. I do appreciate that Euthermal's transitioning out of Mass Oracle into Phoenixes. Ooh, those are kills, not cancels. And then brings a bus into the base, and Euthermal, he ignores the army. He doesn't turn around. Does not turn around. Adepts, they try to hold on to the main base. A lot of probes are falling. This is getting close. 19 probes go down across the map. The Marines, they're wreaking havoc. They're busting into the main. They take down the Phoenixes. 
Again, you thermal he chose not to come back home. He takes out every single worker across the map. But back at home, can he hold on to his main base? Marines, they're going for the pylon, but there's two. Overcharge will barely keep that pylon alive, but alas, there's just too much DP as the pylon goes down. And now we're going for the final pylon. Boys are being pulled. There's only a handful of Marines left. And you throw more. He should clean this up. The Oracles, they've made it back home. And you throw more. Even shuts down the... She even shuts down the medevac as well. He's held. You throw more. Did go down to 18 probes. Doesn't have an ideal economy, but it's better than the Terran. That's all that matters. And you know what? He still has Mass Oracle. How many is that? What? 9, 10, 11 Oracles? Jesus. So that's a lot of Oracles, Bobby. Once again, as we're moving out, sorry, nine. Okay, nine oracles in total, but we have more on the way. As we threaten the main base, stasis trap goes off. Ay, ay, ay. There's that tenth oracle. Yeah, we focus down the mules. We focus down the mineral line. All the SV is going to be going down. And Espar, he's just running out of steam, running out of everything. There's only so much you can do with man with gun. It's a good unit, but it's not that good. We take down one of the oracles. We take down another. But there's so much more where that came from. And GG is going to get called. GG, well played. You thermal will take game number one. Ooh, GG. Again, you thermal. I mentioned before that whenever he can, regardless of what race he rolls, he likes to have that kind of flair with his play. He likes to play these unorthodox styles, whether they're all lit or points, and that does lead into invites for Masses Coalition. Oh, que tal, como estas? Uh, but specifically, I think there's a breakdown on Wikipedia for the last Masses Coliseum, um, but they uh, they sent out invites based on individual player performance in WTL and in Kung Fu Cup. But here we go. We're getting into game number two and spawning in the bottom left-hand corner. We have Euthermal for offside. In the top right, we have Espoir for the Siren Camels. Let's go. Um, but I agree. I mean, obviously, we spoke about it. Like, uh, even with these games played out, Offside has already won the series. That is true. But, you know, there is still a little bit of weight behind these uh, these individual matches. Uh, let him play, Bobby. Let him play. Let's go. Let him play. As we have our answer, by the way, I glossed over it. Euthermal rolls Zerg. And I mentioned this before. This is Euthermal's weakest matchup, his weakest race. So, if Espoir wanted to cause an upset, this is his opportunity, as we're going for a gas first. Now, Euthermal, we've casted a lot of Euthermal over the past month in ESL Open Cups, in WTL, in the EPT Spring Qualifiers. And I'll be honest, every time we cast him in a ZVT, Euthermal has one build. <laughs> he has one build, one build and one build only. only. This should be a Ling Rush, we're, we're rushing into Lings. Followed by a lair, followed by a Ling Flood, and Drop Lord drop into the main, followed by a two base Hydra. He's done the same thing, the same thing time and time again. I imagine that's going to be happening here, but we'll see. We'll see if that's the case, because I might be getting ahead of myself. You know, maybe, maybe he has different variations of gas first. I'm here for it. We can see you thermal. He goes for the standard natural. He doesn't go for the gold. Okay, so the standard natural base instead. Again, he knows that the gold is a bait. The gold is very exposed and very vulnerable. You can see here, Link Speed is on the way, and you can see that he has not pulled out a gas. And I believe that is for a lair, not for a Baneling Nest. That's uh, my assumption, at least, based on what we've seen from Euthermal this past month. Here we go. We do see Espoir moving out with his Reaper. He is moving out across the map. Trying to get a scout off, trying to get a read on what Euthermal is up to. But again, with a more aggressive build, he already has a queen, and he already will soon have Lings on the way. So do avoid that Reaper. There's that layer that we spoke about. Remember, it was Ling Speed into Lair, into Dropper Lords, into Two Base Hydra. Speaking of, Overlords should be soon getting in position. This is so we can Ling Flood and slip into the main base. There we go. You can see the Overlords, they are rotating around. Allowing Euthermal to gain access to that main with his lings. And there it is. We have 10 lings in production. Like, I'll be honest. I have not seen Euthermal do anything else with his Zerg. <laughs> like, it's, it's just been the same build over and over again. 
Let's go. Wings are flooding. Overlords are getting ready. It's going to be two overlords outside the gold. And we're just waiting for the lair to finish. For those that are curious, you actually cannot make an over... Uh, you can't make a dropper lord without a lair. Reaper goes down. Lings have been spotted. And Espar, is he ready in the main base? Again, if Espar survives this, it usually goes into two base Hydra. As you can see, gases are being taken. If you can see on the production tab, gases are being taken. We're joining up. There are those dropper lords towards that gold base. And there's that hydrogen. So it's two base Hydra following the dropper lords. And here we go. The overlords, they do get into that gold base. And Espoir, he's out of position. He's waiting in the main base instead. Uh, boys are going to be going down. Hellion does respond. It's one Hellion, a handful of Marines. Do we have enough? Uh, we're just denying mining time. Uh, and that's all we have to do. Just deny any kind of mining here at the gold. Deny as much income as we can. We can pick up. We get the hell out of here. There's no sim on these Marines. The overlords, they will manage to unload on the other side. So that's four SCV kills. Denied mining time as well. Pretty good damage. And the drop alerts survive. They barely escape. Oh, oh. Can we get it? He wants it, Bobby. He wants it. He wants the drop alert. Doesn't snipe it in the end. Behind this, it's a 2 1 1 follow up. Late third TC from the Terran player. And Hydras are amassing back at her. So from here, it goes into two base Hydra. And it goes into a pretty brutal um, Hydra Ling all in. Very Mia Mica esque. Does hit a pretty brutal timing here. As we're just focusing on the Hydra upgrades for now. Before building up that Hydra count. Here we go. Overseer gets into the main. Gets eyes on the third TC. So you throw more noses. Not a two base all in. At the same time. Drop Lord in towards that mineral line as well. And there's only one marine to defend. Ah yeah yeah. Only one marine. It's going to go down. SCVs as well. Hellions they do respond in time though. Do manage to respond. Only two SCVs go down. That could have been so much worse. And you throw more. He is cutting workers at 44. That is two base saturation. And he's amassing Ling Roach. Sorry Ling Hydra. Like, if you Thermal wanted to, he could take a third. He could expand and drone and go for a longer game. But no, no. That's just not the kind of player you Thermal is. That's just not you Thermal. So here we go. He is moving out. Ling's dropping into the main. And honestly, Espar, all he has to do is defend. Like, he's got a third TC. All he has to do is weather the storm. Cash these Dropper Lords. Catch these Hydras. And he can bounce back. Like, he's not in a bad position. He's mining from the gold. Speaking of, we do get behind it. Oh, we do deny mining here at the gold base. Five SCVs go down. Tank is getting in position. And the tank will siege. Tank will siege. You throw more. He wants it. He wants the tank and he will get it as well. There's no repairs. Not in time. And we continue to deny mining time here at the gold base, which means Espar is on a one base economy. Oh, he's stuck on one base. Stim is done, but we can't engage. Another tank has arrived. And Euthermo is going back into the main with another drop. I believe. I could I, I could be blind. I think there's another drop lord in there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not blind. I, I can see. Drop load went back in. Nine workers went down in total. I'm just going to be rotating around towards that main. Tank is not in position. Euthermal knows that. He sees with his changeling that there are no tanks in sight. Which means we can break on through. Good stutter stepping here from Euthermal. He busts through the front door. Knocks down, the, knocks down those depots. That's a lot of marines. But you have to respect it. Uh, but the Sim City working against the Terran. Is working against him. The Hydra is trading with the Marines. They barely break through. Not the best trade there out of you, Thermal. But he's came to the production nonetheless. And Marines are falling left and right. Tank is repositioning. Can we get the starport? Oh! The starport! It does go down. Big pick off. We're going for the tank as well. And you, Thermal, he may just have too much. 
Uh, just barely. It's so close. The Marines are going down. The tank is exposed. And the final tank goes down. GG gets called. Euthermal, he breaks the main base. And Euthermal will take the 2-0. Offside will take a 6-0 win against the Starving Camels. GG. Whew. GG, well played. Congratulations to Offside as they will claim their 3-0. A dominant performance by all three players. Shout out, to, shout out to Firefly. Shout out to Rex and Euthermal as well. GG, very well done. My condolences to the Starving Camels. Again, they did well for themselves making it this far in the qualifier in Code A. Unfortunately, they could not hold their own here in the end. Uh, Silky, you know, he had a back and forth against Rex. So did Toonming. Uh, I appreciate the all-ins that Toonming did attempt against Firefly. It was a lot of fun. I recommend checking out the VODs. These were some fire games. Not a lot of late game. If you're looking for some late game, this was not the series for it. It was a fast 6 0. <laughs> a lot of all ins, a lot of unorthodox play. I mean, Euthermal went mass Oracle. He went mass Oracle for Christ's sake. It was crazy. Crazy. GG, well played. With that, thanks so much, everyone, for watching. Uh, shout out to Rainer. Oh my God, Bappy. Aye, aye, aye. Big shout out to Rainer here for the 1,000 viewer raid. Hope you had a great stream. Hope you had a great ladder session. Hope you're having a great time in Korea. Do know that Euthermal has been training in Korea in preparation for the GSL. Thank you so much for the raid. Hope you're having a great time. And welcome, everyone. Welcome to the WTL. We're about to go on a break. We're about to go on a break here with some more StarCraft. See you soon. And welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that break as we've returned with our second best of seven of the night with our second elimination match for World Team League WTL Summer 2024 Code A Day Number 5. Here we go. We just wrapped up with Offside versus the Starving Camels, and we are back with Club NV versus Hyperberg. Let's go. We have quite a best of seven lined up for us. We have DRG versus Ford Jumi in a ZVP. We have Quanta versus Hon Mono in a Terran versus Terran. And Mondo versus Special in a Zerg versus Terran. This is going to be a close one. Ay, ay, ay. This is brutal. We are missing our ace player. Club NV are not fielding creator. I am a little bit concerned. I am a little bit concerned. Creator is a heavy hitter creator he's one of the best protos in the world and creator he is not here for his team if creator was here i would say 100 percent club nv are favored in this series without creator i'm not so confident i'm no longer that confident here uh hyperberg they can pop off for those of you curious hyperberg is a joint team hyperberg is a joint team it is team hyper one in conjunction with Freiburg Esports. Uh, so they have kind of joined forces here. Two teams have turned into one for WTL Code A. And they're a pretty solid lineup. They're a pretty solid lineup here for Jumi, Home Mono, and Special. They are no slouches here. They are solid. And I want to favor them against Club NV, which is something that I was not coming into this thinking. For those that are curious, um, did we break him? Um, I think Creator's at a wedding. I I, um, I think I was looking at Creator's Instagram, and I think he was posting about a friend's, uh, a friend's wedding, and I think he might have been a part of it. I don't know. Not that he was getting married, but I think he was um, he, he was at the at the event itself. So um, Creator, he may not be available here tonight. Hopefully, it's not serious. Um, but uh, yeah, he isn't available, and without him, really give a boost to your team and give them a, a leg up here in this format. Oh boy. Hunter, Percival, Ginio, Honmono. They all rose up together. For those that are curious, I'm referring to uh, these more amateur Code A Korean Terran players. Honmono, Ginio, Percival, and uh, and Quanta specifically. Um, they all rose up through the COVID era of StarCraft. Um, of course, Percival was around even before that, but all of them really started to commit and improve starting around 2020-ish era of StarCraft and rose through the ranks. But um, as of late, as of the past year, it feels like Homono has broken away from the pack. And Homono has really been improving a lot. And also in the last year, you know, Ginio isn't active anymore. Percival isn't active anymore. It, it does come down to Homono and Quanta as the remaining up-and-coming Korean Terrans. And uh, it does feel like Homono has leveled up quite a bit. Meanwhile, Quanta has stagnated a little bit instead. 
I do know that Quanta, he semi-retired for a while. Did semi-retire, so that doesn't help. So uh, that's that's going to be an interesting one. Two old friends facing off once again. Likewise, Mondo versus Special is also going to be interesting, considering that Mondo also retired last year. Mondo, he uh, he's he's an upcoming Korean Zerg player. Okay, this, there was quite a lot of them. Uh, he's an upcoming Korean Zerg player. It was doing very well for himself. Was competing in the previous seasons of WTL, and uh, he was peaking. He was doing well for himself, and then he retired. I want to say around November of last year, maybe before that. Um, but he did officially retire. He stepped away. I think it was after his WTL win. He was like content with what he had achieved. He'd stepped away from the game, but uh, as of a couple of months ago, he came back. He came back. He, you know, he uh, he came back from retirement. You're never really gone from StarCraft. Um, I remember I was talking to Mondo, and he came back when he was offered a show match. I think, um, God, was it the Mondo show match versus Quanta? I think that was the case uh, during the Club NV show matches that we were casting. And uh, Mondo was like, yeah, you know, like the owner of Club NV, he, he, he wanted me to play. So I'm like, fine, I'll play, I'll play. And Mondo has been more active since then. So it's great to see Mondo return to the game after after straight up retiring and stopping competing for, for a couple of months. So it was great to see him return. Um, but it's only been a couple of months. And to be honest, I'm not so certain if Mondo is quite at the level that he was last year around November, around, you know, around that time. So uh, we'll see. We'll see if Mondo can can compare and can compete with Special. Special is another player. Like talking about retired players, Special never retired, um, but he has been less active. You know, uh, he at one point was the dominant force in Latin America. He was constantly competing uh, amongst the Koreans in Korea. But um, after some visa issues, what was it a year ago? I think just under two years ago, but. After there were some visa issues, after Special had to return from Korea to um, to his hometown in Mexico, um, after that occurred, it did feel like Special was maybe a little bit less motivated to compete. Because of that, he was playing less, but he was also working on himself. If you follow uh, Special on social media, you would know that he's been very active, like in the gym, you know, posting updates, like improving on himself and, and on, you know, aspects outside of StarCraft, which is always a good thing. We always champion that. But it does come at the cost of practicing less. It does feel like that's been the case. Uh, especially, uh, usually if the starting players are missing, they are willing to postpone. They like they push DRG and 4 Jimmy back to like um to like the third match to give them as much time as possible to show up. And uh, they might decide to play Quanta versus Homeowner first instead. So that's usually what happens. Like they they don't just like. Put the walker over then and there they try to make it work and they they message the the teams and they work something out and they agree that maybe they can like push you. regardless of which team you're cheering for regardless of who you want to win you know you don't want to win via walkover you want to win with your skill you know with your play that's good uh, okay we're good we're good we're diving in Whew. we are diving in. in the top right hand corner we have for club nv mondo and in the bottom left hand corner, we have the opponent. We have the Mexican Terran player for Hyperberg special. Let's go. I believe predictions should be closing. They should be closing up for our first series here. It is a best of two, not a best of three, as a reminder. And we're loading into Crimson Court. Special opting to go for his special build. I believe this is going to be Rax followed by the factory on the low ground. Uh, it is a build that Special has been quite fond of over his years, over, his, over, his, over these most recent years of StarCraft. But we'll see. We'll see if that's the case or if he goes for a 2 Rax Reaper build instead. Both are available. Both are options. Again, we haven't seen too much 2 Rax Reaper this patch. It was very popular a year ago, or very popular last patch even, uh, from players like Bjorn, of course, from Maru, from all, I mean, all the Terran players out there. They all dabbled in it last year at one point or another. And there it is, 2 Rax Reaper. Let's go. It's been a while. I'll be honest. It's been a while since we've seen this. It's a build that permeated through the meta and was, was quite popular in the last patch in the last year, 2023. And as special, he's whipping it out here in 2024. Now, the goal of this is typically to delay the third. We go two Axe Reaper, we commit into three Reapers, and we delay the third base. We contain the opponents, we expand behind this, and we transition into a bio push on two bases um, with a third CC on the way. 
So this is not an all-in by any means, it's just a way to get ahead economically in the early game. Depending on your control, you can also pick off some drones, maybe get a queen, big maybe on that one. Uh, but again, the least that we ask for is to delay the third. As the Overlord gets across the map, and Mondo does confirm the build. Behind this special should be expanding, he has not thrown down a third CC. Sorry, he doesn't throw down a third Rax, what I meant to say. And a special now has enough, and he does start up his command center. There we go. So again, just 2 racks Reaper is moving out. And Mondo's going to be staying on two bases. Reaper has arrived, and it's on Mondo to minimize his losses, to rush into link speed, and to eventually break out. Did, it, did I invest quite heavily here into these lings early on? I'm just going to slow him down a little bit here as one ling goes down. Queen has arrived. Again, this is a bit of a skill check here for Mondo. And I'm hoping he can keep up. You can see that Special has already stopped Reaper production. Again, it's usually three. Just get three Reapers, and then we just, we just transition the hell out from there. I appreciate as well that Special, he started up a couple of Marines before he starts his add-ons. Being very safe. And there it is. The first reactor has begun. Soon to be a tech lab thereafter. As Reapers, they dip into the main base. They do throw in the mineral line. They go for the, the drones, and they do get one. One drone goes down. We get us around. We try to, but the Reapers, they slip away. The Reapers, they will manage to escape towards that natural base, but one Reaper does not go down. The KDA charge just in time saves the Reaper, and Mondo is stuck on two bases. No tech lab, by the way, from Special. Interesting. So this is a different variation. The follow-up is quite different, I should say. Um, only reactor. It looks like we're going for an add-on swap for a Hellion production. Yep, there it is. There's that add-on swap for Hellions. We do delay Stim. Interesting. So Stim is going to be delayed. We have our starport on the way behind this, I imagine, for medevac production, but we'll see. Special does race back home. Mondo still has yet to take a third. Still has yet to expand. As we are getting into Roach play. Okay. Our tech has been thrown down. Roach is going to be on the horizon here by Mondo. We have seen Mondo go for a lot of all-ins. Uh, Roach-based all-ins in ZVT, specifically off of three bases. I believe we saw that last time. As Special behind this is going for a fusion core? Oh, he gets scouted! No shot, he's he's crazy. He's going for the fusion core behind this. Going medevac first into fusion core. A wild build here out of special, but he is spotted by Mondo. Mondo knows, he's aware, he's getting ready. Queen's in production, Lair is in production as well. Where's the third, by the way? Again, this third base is so late for Mondo. I am quite concerned here. Has yet to throw it down. Is respecting the army of special quite a bit. Meanwhile, Special is the first to start a third. That is something that I was not expecting to say. But a faster third from Special. Aye, aye, aye. As we are going for our drop across the map, Hellions have arrived. We dive on top of the Queens. And Queens are going to be going down one after the other. Two Queens fall. No transfuse. A rough start here from Mondo, and he's in a lot of trouble. We're going for another Queen. Remember, there is no Stim, at least. That's still a lot of DPS, still a lot of firepower. As Mondo, he's mining through those, through those mineral patches. He's going for the linear third base instead. We have the Spire on the way. As we can see here, that was just pointed out, the fusion core was cancelled. Because it got scouted, Special is not going BC anymore. He's going for Liberators. So this Spire is not as useful for Mondo, unfortunately. I mean, I guess he could still go Muta, but... um, It's quite a lot of gas that he's already working with. When it comes to spending it on these on these roaches. Liberator has arrived. Does lay siege upon the natural. Good reaction to Mondo. He does pull away. Meanwhile, Hellion drop into the main race. And Mondo, he is late to react to that. A drone is picked off. Only one, though. Could have been so much worse as the Ling Roach is in position. We shut down the Hellions. But we do scout the Spire. Oh, and we are still getting drones. Again, good positioning here at a special. He gets three long-distance mining workers. And he will back off. The Liberator does survive. Stim is about to finish up. And special is about to be that much more active on the map. He's about to push here as he expands. Meanwhile, Mondo is investing into plus one air attack. Oh, boy. And he's going Corruptor? Okay. Roach Corruptor. 
a little bit old school of a composition. It's been a while since we've seen this. But this is going to be Roach Corruptor. Quite a beefy army here. Aliens, they head for the Mineral Line. They do get a handful of drones. Two workers are going to be going down. Corruptors are amassing. Roach is alongside them. A little bit ambitious there by Special diving with the Hellion. But regardless, he does, of course, still confirm that Roaches are continuing to amass. Corruptors on the way. And the Corruptors, they will help when it comes to dealing with the drop play. But can we deal with the ground army? As again, Mondo is still behind economically. We have an even base count, sorry, an even, yeah, even base count and even drone count. But Special does have mules. He does have a more efficient army. Is pushing on forward, clears up a lot of creep. Mondo will force him back. Has a crop to punish those medivacs as well. So he does hold. And Mondo, are we going to keep on pushing, by the way? He's still massing more lings and roaches. He's not droning. We spoke about this. We spoke about how Mondo, the last time we saw him, he did go for a roach three base all in in ZVT. And I don't see any more drones on the horizon. 54 workers. That's all we have. We're knocking down these rocks. It looks like Mondo is going for the all-in. Yeah, it's all or nothing for Mondo. And if Special is too greedy, he can be caught out. For now, though, he has his tanks in position. They're decently spread out as well. So he can avoid those vials. Two tours on the horizon. And we have a good position here on top of the ramp. And you can see here that Mondo has still yet to make a worker for quite some time. He is all in. It's all or nothing for Mondo. Oh, that's quite a lot here. Special, he's ready for this tank shot. It's going to be going off. He does send forward. Wow, they didn't quite reach the tanks. We try to force the issue here. The first tank is going to be going down. And we barely get the second as well. But the Marines, they stim on forward. They break through the roaches. And Special completely cleans this up. He annihilates the Roach Army, the Corruptors as well. Again, pushing up a ramp into three tanks. Uh, you saw how quickly that army melted. And Special has a massive lead. And now Mondo's droning. Uh -huh. Now is not the time. We're droning up behind this, but it's too little too late. Special has a massive lead at this point. Is moving out. And Mondo's in a lot of trouble. Remember, no Banelings. Baneliness just now started. No Ravagers either. It's just purely Ling Roach. We can just stim and win. We have a couple of Ravagers behind this. Well, there's just nothing to stop the man with gun. Yeah, we're snowballing out of control. We get on top of the Roach Warren. The tank survives. The tank barely does survive as well. Again, reinforcements that are trickling in. We don't have any Medivacs. We don't have any sustain. But GG gets called. As special snowballs out of control and takes game number one. GG. GG, well played. A solid game there at a special. Mondo, I'm not so certain how how often Mondo's in that position just because two Axe Reaper is so uncommon, but it took him so long to take a third base. It took him so long to get into his all in specifically because of the late third. Late drones, because late drones, late all in. Like, uh, sure, all ins they don't require a solid economy. Yeah, that's true, but they require enough of an economy to, sta to sustain themselves. And the longer the game goes on, the worse it does become for the all inning player, as the defending player gets that much more and more secure. And special, he was ready for it. I don't believe special even confirmed the all in. I don't think he saw the army moving out through the center of the map, but he just happened to, you know, already be in position back at home with his tanks, with his marines, quite easily handle himself. GG. GG well played. Solid game there from Special. And we'll see if Mondo can bounce back. As we're getting ready for game number two. Here we go. As a reminder, this is a best of two and it's loser's pick. So Mondo, his map of choice is going to be Oceanborn. Not a bad map for a virtual lid. We're getting into game number two. And spawning in the bottom right hand corner, we have Mondo for Club Envy. And in the top left, we have Special for Hyperberg. Let's go. As Zerg versus Terran does continue. Special once again going for the depot on the low ground, which means a low ground, low ground rack setup. It could be another two racks Reaper. 
could be true Axe Reaper once again. I mean, special, he had so much success with it in game number one. May as well just double down and do it again in game two. We'll see. We'll see if that's what special goes for. Remember, there are different variations of this. You could go three Rax Reaper and just commit even harder. Um, you could go you could go two Rax Reaper into a 2-1-1. One, one. Could go into a four Rax follow-up off of two bases. If you were actively watching a lot of Beyond last year, you, you would have seen just so many different builds, so many different variations that you can kind of branch off from this opener. Special is getting into this. And again, this looks like it might just be Rax into Factory on the low ground. This is this is the initial build that I thought that Special was doing in Game 1, if you remember. I was talking about how Special is quite fond of Rax Factory on the low ground um, to set up a, a wall early on to get into his two base play. And yep, there it is. Rax is done. Factory is going to be on the way. So this is more of the... Oh, this is the Special build. Uh, this is more akin to Special... Something more unique to him. I think we've seen Gumiho do this like once or twice. Like Gumiho, he dabbles in this every now and then. Maybe we've seen... I, we have seen Kyo do this as well, 100%. I've seen him do this on Side Delta specifically because of the ramp. Because of the ramp leading into the natural, it feels a little bit safer to do this on Side Delta. There is that factory. So, not 2 Rex Reaper. Not this time. The Overlord will scout. The Overlord will confirm. As special is to take his natural. So from here, this does mean that Mondo should be able to expand. It means that his third base should not be anywhere near as late. Reaper has arrived. For now, the drones are being kept in the natural. Oh, we didn't bring one over. Uh, that is a little bit brutal here as Reaper almost gets a drone. Good spore trick out of Mondo. Does save the worker in the end. But uh, his third base is going to be delayed as he is contained. And we are going for a fast armory. Oh my god. That's special. We're going for a Hellbat push. Okay. Add on swap into a Hellbat push. Third base is now going to be on the way. But special being such a nuisance here. Delays it for so long. Forces back the drone. But finally it's on the way. And we need to scout. We need to get eyes on what is coming up next. Mondo has no idea to be ready for something like Hellbats. Now, something like Bailings or even a Roach Response would shut this down, but even with a high enough Queen count, we can hold our own. As I say that, Mondo's droning, and Mondo... Where is our third and fourth Queen? Uh, there we go. Just starting off the Queens now. Do we have enough to defend? We have two Queens here at the Natural. We're still building up that Hellion count. Cyclones on the way is okay. Especially, he's cooking, Papi. He's cooking. What do you have for us? We're going to have, what, four Hellbats and two Cyclones? This is uh, going to be an interesting one here. Special, again, applying pressure to the third base. Poking and prodding, forcing out some Lings. And there we go, the Hellbats, they have been revealed. We're looking to dive on those Queens. They do manage to waddle away. There's three Queens in total, soon to be four. Again, we did delay Queen production. And there we go, the fourth Queen is coming down from the main base. Hatchery under fire. And can we manage to get a queen here? A fifth queen has arrived. So far we're holding. Where are those cyclones? Where are the cyclones, Papi? Now remember, the cyclone has been nerfed. It has been changed, but it still poses a threat. Still something to be respected. We managed to get one overlord. We're going for another. Oh, that will supply block Mondo. It does get supply blocked. Good pickups so far by special. The Hellback Count's getting higher and higher. Keeping these Cyclones safe from the Lings. Ooh, and we get a Queen! Transfuse was not available. Ay ay ay. Transfuse not available. The Queen Count getting quite high. We do manage to keep the rest of our Queens alive. We're holding our own. And can we manage to get another? The Cyclones still stand strong. Pretty good value so far. And these things, what can they really do? Oh! Oh my god, as we don't break the lock on, we get so much damage done on that queen. Yeah, the lings, they cannot touch this. As we do focus on another Hellbat. The special just continuing to reinforce. 
The link cannon is getting higher, and it looks like Mondo, he's held. We've weathered the storm. We've, got, we've gone through the worst of it. That could have been so much worse. There's a world out there if Mondo was a lesser player that he would bleed out a second, a third, a fourth queen, and Special would win then and there. But very careful control there out of Mondo. Very careful control. Didn't overextend, didn't throw away his lings, more importantly. And he has held. Behind this, it's mech. <laughs> Behind this, uh, Special is playing a form of mech, is working on Hyper Flights. No, no not quite Hyper Flight Rotors. Um, Hurricane Engines, that's it. Has changed its name from Hurricane Thrusters to Hurricane Engines. Did change the graphic as well. We have more Cyclones on the way. Tanks are amassing back at home. We have plus one vehicle weapons about to finish up. I believe the upgrade itself didn't change, it was just the name of the icon. For lore reasons, I, I guess. Because people were upset about that. I, I, didn't. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's good. I guess that's cool. So do you see his special rotating around, catching a queen! Gets one! Does manage to catch a queen, the rest do zone back special. Behind this, Mondo, he's joining his hard out, trying to saturate his third base, taking a fourth as we speak. And has been working towards Roach Ravager. As I say that once again, though, the lock ones are real. We do manage to get some more queens. But the Hellbats, they are thrown away. Without Hellbats, these Cyclones, they don't have any support. They have to back off. Mondo, he is holding that Cyclone count, getting higher. Going for another queen. We still don't have that upgrade. Still on the way. A special trading quite efficiently so far. Losing a minimal amount of cyclones before retreating. And it's still embracing that mech. Again, if you were here earlier today, you would have seen that um, we casted Cure versus Dark, and the only game that Cure won against Dark was when Cure played mech. Likewise, we also casted uh, Dark versus Gumiho a couple of days ago. Gumiho did actually take down Dark with mech as well. So mech has been making a bit of a resurgence. At least amongst some of the Korean Terrans, and I guess Special as well. Right, it's been interesting to see players uh, adapt and make use of the new Cyclone. The new old Cyclone, in a way. As Mondo, his response to this is to go into Swarm Host. Bold move here. I'm not in love with Swarm Host when it comes to battle mech. Um, against a more traditional form of mech, because you have map control, you can do a lot more. Here, if Mondo is able to zone away those Cyclones, then these Swarm Hosts can pop up. And there it is, we have the Nidus Worm across the map. He is getting across the map here. The, the, the Swarm Host, they have arrived. And we'll see what we can pick off. Again, the first Locust Wave is going to be quite crucial here. Get more across the map. Five drones go down to the Helium Rumbai. We're going for the army! We're diving on top of the first tank. The tank is going to be going down, but we clean up the Locust Wave. And special, he will hold. He bleeds out one tank, but really only that. Forces back the army. Nidus Worm is shut down, and we're waiting for our next Locust Wave. Now, at least Mondo is containing special here, denying him his fourth. It's going to be the name of the game for Mondo. Keep that tank out low. Deny the fourth base. The Locust Wave has reset. And we don't actually have that many Cyclones anymore. We can try to break through. So once again, we're looking to dive on those tanks. The Roach Ravager pushing forward. We try to bail them down. One more tank falls. Oh, but we bleed out a lot of Roaches there. Ah, not the best trade for Mondo. Now, thankfully, Mondo does have map control, and he does have a bit of a better economy here on four bases. Now taking a fifth. He has more efficient mining. Maybe a better way of putting it. As I say that, especially sneaking out of fourth. Mondo needs to get eyes on this. He cannot let this get up and running. Otherwise, special will snowball out of control. Or at least he can. Like I say, coming in once again. 
Hellbats are in position. We go for the tank. We get one. We get two. I shall bile down a second tank there. Not bad pickoffs by Mondo, but he still has not seen the fourth base. Doesn't know that it's already up and running. Did he see the, did he see the SCVs? Oh, I think he did. Yeah, yeah, he has spotted the SCVs. Does rotate around. The planetary is not done. And workers are going down. Managed to get nine SCVs. Especially he's fighting back. He it looks like he will be able to take control of that base. But here comes another Locust Wave. Again, Mondo is still bleeding out a lot. But special, he saves the base. That's what's important. Planetary is on the way. Locust Wave diving in. Oh, we're running out of Ravagers. Good target firing there at a special. Does annihilate the Roach Ravager. And this is what I was worried about. Special, he was able to sneak out that fourth. He got away with it. It's a planetary. It's up and running. And now look at this army from special. So many tanks. We're pushing. He breaks through. He breaks free. Special, he has a pretty terrifying army supply that he's working with. And can we hold on? Without a Locust Wave, it's going to be difficult. Roaches are going down. Ravagers are now spawning in. There we go. The Swarm host, they're ready. They're ready for another wave. When they do collapse on the army, they do, ma they do manage to get three more tanks. And a fourth. Not bad. For five tanks going down. Expensive losses here. Where's the Cyclones? We needed a buffer. We needed something to protect these tanks. And too many went down. A much better trade for Mondo. It does overextend. Oh, this... It's less than ideal pushing up the ramp. But again, special, he was lacking Hellions, lacking Cyclones. Now they come in to reinforce after five tanks went down. Mondo, he's holding. He's trying to. Desperately trying to hold on, but now special taking another base, at least trying to. Cyclones, they get on top of the Ravagers. Mondo in a lot of trouble here. And he needs more time. The Stormhosts, they come back home. Ah, but they're on their own. We bled out far too much Red Travager. And Special, for the first time in a long time, takes a supply lead. He cleans up the Locust Wave. This is the army that's left. Three Ravagers, two Roaches, and a handful of Queens. And Special, he's done it. He has done it. He's broken through. He's broken the Zerg army. GG gets called. And Special will take the 2-0. Taking a lead. For Hyperberg. GG. GG. Well played. You can see the momentum very quickly swing. One special got his fourth base up and running. Once he was able to catch too many Roach. Or just a little bit too much Roach Ravager as well. As Mono did throw away too much supply there. And things very quickly swung in favor of special. Was able to break out. Break free. And counter. It. We have tonight's ace player in Dong Rei Gu. He's looking to bounce back and tie up the score. And... Give his team a chance here to make it through into Kodas. Well, Jimmy on that Clem sleep schedule. True, Poppy, true. Aye, aye, aye. These gamers, Poppy. Pressure's on it. Pressure is on Envy. It is on Envy. To be fair, again, Dong Rei Gu should be feeling confident. But be careful, right? Don't be overconfident. For Jimmy, we spoke about him. He's a very aggressive player, very unorthodox at times. And if you don't take him seriously enough, he can catch you off guard. And here we go. In the top left-hand corner, we have DRG for Club Envy. And in the top right, we have his opponent. We have for Jimmy for Hyperberg. Let's go. Whew. Let us go. Now, we're spawning into Ghost River. The shortest rush distance map in the map pool. It is known for its aggression. It's known for its all-ins from either side. So we'll see who's the first to really try to make use of that. We'll keep our eye on both Dong Regu and Forjumi. Here we go. And again, my condolences to Mondo. Um, special, he was a, a titan of a player to go up against. Arguably, um, arguably, Special is the strongest player on Hyperberg. I think you could make that argument, definitely. That uh, he is the at least most accomplished player on Hyperberg. And um, as a result, the strongest as well is their ace. So it was a rough series, a rough, a rough matchup there for Mondo. But again, DRG has a chance here to bring it all back. 
And so now it's going to be a hatch gas pool. Hatch gas pool opener here from Dong Regu. Meanwhile, Jumi just going for his gate expand into his cyber core. Really what I'm looking for when it comes to our Protoss player is our tech of choice. Do we go for a Twilight Council opener, a Stargate, or a Robo? I feel like more often than not, when I cast for Jumi, we see a Twilight Council more than anything. <laughs> we see some form of aggression, whether it's Glaive Adepts, Dark Shrine, a Charge All In. Like for Jumi, he has no shame, Bobby, willing to whip anything out. Um, but that is an interesting pylon placement. You see the pylon at the edge of his base would be ideal for something like a Stargate. As it is closer to, of course, DRG's base, does reduce the time it takes for the Oracle to get across the map, and it is easy to scout, so unlikely to hide or to go for something like a Twilight Council out in the open like that. So based on the pylon, it looks like a Stargate, but we'll see. We'll keep our eyes on Forjumi. As, oh my god, we're going for the Robo, and we do not throw it down at that pylon location. We throw it down at the natural instead. Let's go, Bobby. Let's go. The Stalker has arrived. We're going to be zoning back that Overlord, the Overlord, and the goal here is to keep DRG in the dark. And this is what I spoke about when it comes to Fort Jumi. I mean, I did say that a Twilight Council is what we see more often than not, but what I should have said is that a Stargate is what we see least often out of Fort Jumi. This is going to be a Robo-based opener. Um, now... If this was a sane player, if this was a standard player, I would assume that this would be something like a disruptor drop, right? It's like a, a robo into a bay, into disruptors, into a meta, into a war prism to drop across the map. Because it's for Jumi, I'm not so confident. I'm not so confident in saying that, so we'll see. There we go. That's a second robo. This is not your standard disruptor drop. This is a double robo, double disruptor drop with two war prisms. This is a build that Four Jimmy is quite fond of. I believe Astraea created this build, if I'm not mistaken. I know that we, we've seen Astraea do this before. We have seen him do it. I'm uncertain if he made it, though. Uncertain of that. Regardless, Four Jimmy is whipping out the double robo. Show us your balls, Bobby. Show us your disruptors. Let's go. Oh, boy. Now, it takes a lot of control. It takes a lot of attention, a lot of micro to pull this off. Um... As you can imagine, microing and controlling two medevacs and two disruptors, or sorry, I should say four disruptors and then six, is a difficult thing to do. Overlord tries to go back in for a scout. It is going to be denied, or is it? DRG is getting closer. Up! Oh, and it looks like he will not get eyes on the tech. DRG is in the dark. Doesn't know what's coming his way. Has no idea. There's that first disruptor. I saw in the chat. He should name change to 4 p.m. Jimmy. Oh my god. <laughs> I love that. That's great. That's good, I saw. That's good. Uh, there's more prison speed on the way. Getting into more disruptors. And this should be getting into a second prism. There we go. There's that second prism. Again, as you mentioned, this is a double robo, double disruptor drop with two war prisms. Oh boy. If you've been tuning into for Jimmy's stream, then you would have seen him with this out, I'm sure, many a time in a ladder session. Is quite fond of this. And at least he has successfully kept DRG in the dark. Behind this, DRG is going for a safety roach war and is making safety roaches. The drop has arrived. We're going for that natural base. And we're going for the queen. Would you get one? No big damage yet, but we do manage to get two. Oh, we managed to get one queen. Good value. Oh, this is a mistake. That is not a second prism, that's a third war prism. I'm pretty sure this build, from what we've seen, is not meant to be with three war prisms. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. So uh, maybe a little bit of nerves or maybe a little bit of drowsiness uh, slipping in there. But we have gone up to three war prisms, which is quite a lot. So that does delay the disruptor control, sorry, the disruptor production. As no one's going to be going off, they don't quite connect, only with the tumor. He's like, more prism. Let's make a fourth war prism. Ah, oh, let's go. Aye, aye, aye. Colossal production has commenced. There we go. We're going for another drop through here through the center. Interesting that he's making use of one of those war prisms to distract DRG. So we have three prisms being active on the map. What can we get done? The prism. The disruptor almost goes down. Meanwhile, the prism takes a lot of hits by the queens. Bit of a miss rally there. Good positioning out of DRG. Very nicely done. Almost gets the War Prism. As I do see for Jimmy, 
Oh, but not quite getting a queen, but he does, I guess, juggle on over and he does replace that War Prism with a full HP one. And I'm worried because so far he hasn't done enough. He's killed, what, one, maybe two queens so far? And this is such a big investment as well. So many disruptors. We have so much potential. So little damage. Yeah, as we get one Nova off, it takes two Novas to kill a queen. The queen survives. Before Jumi backs off. Aye, aye, aye. But he is getting into Colossus production, Immortals. Like, his army is quite beefy. It's quite, uh, quite terrifying in its own way. On two bases. Nova goes off in the mineral line. We get four drones. Good damage. Four workers go down. We manage to get another drone towards the end. And what I will say is at least Forjumi hasn't lost any disruptors. He's gotten close. Like, a lot of these prisms and disruptors have gotten very low. But he has kept them alive. Gets another queen. And DRG's had enough. <laughs> DRG's had enough. He's pushing out across the map. He's joined up to three bases. Joined up to, to 60. And he's moving out with his army. Nova goes off. Big connection. 12 drones go down. Massive shot in the main base. Meanwhile, DRG forcing his way into the natural. There is no shield battery. There is no overcharge. But that is the brutal choke point. And the disruptors, they come back home. Nova goes off. Doesn't connect. Good target firing out of DRG. More Nova's going to be going off as well. But once again, we focus on the disruptors. Good, good target firing out of Dong Regu. A good splits as well. And DRG, he may not be killing for Jumi. He may not be breaking the natural, but he is containing him to two bases. He's containing, and he did kill a lot of disruptors. We're down to two. Two disruptors left. Never goes off. Ooh, does get focused down. Ay, ay, ay. Down to one disruptor. And DRG is moving out once again. Still on a low drone count of 52. Sub 3 base saturation. And he is pushing in. Still no shield batteries, by the way. The gateways do fall. But that is four Colossi. Like breaking this is not going to be easy. But at the same time, I don't think Forjumi can ever push out. If he does, he's prone to being surrounded. Like, how, how do we break out of this? I don't think we do. Like, it's, it's a good army, don't get me wrong, but... Yeah, I think the play for Forjumi would, ha would have to be to just take a third. Takes down the Overlord. Does he push? Here we go. We are moving out. We are pushing. And DRG is about to max out. He's about to reach that 200 supply. Shaves off some sentries. Nova goes off. Gets two roaches. Another disruptor has arrived. But you can see here that Forjumi just cannot get past that halfway mark. It's not going to happen. He's trying, though. Rotates around. Infestation bits on the way. Now we see DRG finally droning up. Getting up to 60 workers again. Infestation bit does give access to a hive. To Viper Tech. And Forjumi does push on to creep. Another disruptor goes down. Nova will connect. Got some Ravagers. Good connection. Ah, but we bleed out more sentries. Poor Jimmy being forced off of creep. Good zoning Novas, though. Good trades out of Poor Jimmy. Does take some bars to the face. But for Jimmy, he's gaining ground. Now, what's important here is that creep is receding. He's clearing up all this creep, making this center of the map that much more hospitable for Protoss. and does avoid the Biles. Oh, as the Roaches have been missed. By the way, Fujimi is two base all in. He did not expand, did not take a third base. DRG doesn't know that. He's going for a run by to deny the third, a third that doesn't exist. He's like, oh, <laughs> okay. There we go, self. Uh, does overshoot. Bit unfortunate, Disruptor goes down and this actually forces Fujimi back home. And we have tunneling claws. No! Ooh, the friendly fire. Ay, ay, ay. 
Brutal there for Fujimi and Roach as they get into the main, they get into the natural. The prism goes down, but it's fine. I think we have like three more. It's, it's, don't worry about it. <laughs> we have plenty of prisms out there, I think. I saw one earlier towards the north, but it may have fallen as well. And DRG, he's gotten up to Hive Tech. The Hive is done, and here come the Vipers. This is the only thing he was really missing to deal with his high-tech army. And now he can have his way with the Colossus and Disruptors. And there's no counterplay. There's no High Templar. There's no feedbacks. He has to rely on his Stalkers to keep his unit safe. Otherwise, DRG is going to be yoinking every single Colossus and every single Disruptor. Roach as they unbow in the Mineral Lines. Three probes go down. And the armies, they do dance with each other. Do poke back and forth. Decent connection on some of those roaches. Okay, there's no way out of this here for Fujimi. It's all or nothing. And where are those vipers? Where are they? She does take some of these bots to the face. Oof. And the vipers are still gathering energy, but they should be done soon. Decent nervous. They take on some ravagers. Where are the vipers, by the way? <laughs> I think they're at the natural. There we go, they're coming in! Throw down a blinding cloud and show us the abductions. There we go, we get a Colossus. Managed to get one. Decent Nova. As we throw down another blinding cloud, the Novas, they do zone back the army. We're getting on top of the base, the hatchery will fall. Not bad from Fort Jimmy. Oof. As the OG bounces back a little bit too soon. Like for Jimmy, he's doing quite well for himself. Getting on top of the base, forcing back the army. The RG has to be careful, bleeding out even more roaches. Jimmy, can we pull this off? For the Vipers, they broke up once again. They throw down the blinding clouds. They cover the army. Nova will connect, but it looks like there's just too much roaches. Too much roach ravager. As DRG gets a full surround, and for Jimmy cannot sustain these losses. Remember, he was all in on two bases. He's running out of money, running out of steam. He cannot reinforce. Only a handful of stalkers. The longer this goes on, the better it is for Dong Regu. I mean, hey, for Jimmy, he did break a base. He was able to trade with the army. It just took so long. It just took far too long to make this happen. DRG had so much time to get his third, to get his fourth, to build up a bank. And to get into Hive Tech, and here we go, we yoink what little is left. We have two Colossi remaining. We're down to two, we're down to a handful of units here, and Dong Rei Gu is going to be starting things off here with a win. GG! DRG puts a point on the board. <laughs> GG, well played. An interesting game there out of Fort Jimmy. It was, again, a double river opener. Double Rover into a double Disruptor drop. Went up to three War Prisms. Again, I think that was a bit of a slip up there. And the Disruptors were doing okay, but no major damage. Remember, they were they killed like two Queens. They killed like four Drones. Uh, the Disruptors were a little bit lackluster. And because of that, DRG was able to build up towards a mass amount of Roach Ravager. And was able to be proactive. Not even just denying the third, but even at times pushing into the natural. Killing Disruptors, killing Colossi. DRG was very much so looking comfortable um there were a couple of good moments for Fujimi where he was able to get 12 drones and get some decent connections on the road here we go as we're getting into game number two and spawning in the top right hand corner of dynasty we have the south korean zerg player drg for club envy and in the bottom left we have for jimmy for hyperberg let us go Seems to be the use of the phrase whip it out being thrown around a lot. Just saying. That's intentional, Bobby. That's intentional. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. I, I'm aware, Bobby. I'm aware. Don't you worry. No good enough execution with the prism. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, like the war prisons were lackluster, right? When you're, when you're investing that heavily, when you're committing that hard into disruptor drops, like they need to get more done and... Again, that led into why it was that um, that it did take Fujimi a little bit longer to actually get into his game, to get into his eventual push. He was unable to slow down DRG enough, which uh, did make the rest of the game that much more difficult for Fujimi to bounce back in. 
and to execute his two base all in. As a DRG, he's going for the goal base. Bold move here out of DRG. We'll see, can he hold on to it? What I was referring to earlier here is that, sure, it's a goal base, it's lucrative, it's tempting, it's juicy, it's gold. The problem here is that when it comes to Protoss play, especially even standard play, Adept Harass, Oracle Harass, Blink Stalkers, all things that can take advantage of that position, they can take advantage of the Zerg. So this is quite confident play out of DRG. Very confident. And we'll see if he gets punished for it. We'll see if that is overconfidence from Dongegu. For now, it is going to be a gate expand from Forjumi, going for his own goal base. Now, traditionally, we have seen if a Zerg player does go for the goal base here, it's to get into fast roach production. To get into earlier roaches, with roaches, you can be aggressive yourself. You can try to punish the goal base of your opponents and be a little bit more active on the map and gain map control, essentially. We'll see if that's going to be the case for DRG if he does commit into that. But now we're just easing into things, and for Jimmy is going into his Stargate. Okay, we have our take of choice. Stargate opener. Standard game so far. No crazy Robo, no crazy Twilight Council, just a Stargate for the time being. Now, Stargate doesn't have to be standard play. You know, this could be for a Void Ray first into, like, double Stargate into Sky Toss, for example, or Phoenix into Mass Oracle. There's a lot available here, but... At least I'm hoping that we see a more standard straight-up game from Forjumi. Hoping he can showcase that. We'll see. Wings, they do get across the map. Going to be applying some pressure here at the natural. Stalker is revealed. And it is going to be an Oracle first. Okay. We are going for the initial Oracle. Overlord goes in for a scout. Stalker tries to deny said scout. And Lings do not get in. But the Overlord will confirm everything. Does get eyes on the Stargate. That is a fast robo. Okay. You have my attention. Oh my. Oh my. Okay. <laughs> so for Jimmy, instead of going for triple Oracle into a third base, we are going to be staying on two bases and we throw down a robo and a Twilight Council. Very interesting. That is after the Overlord goes down. So DRG is in the dark. He does not see the follow-up, doesn't see the tech, doesn't know what's going on. This is not a standard game. Uh, double Twilight Council? That's not going to be intentional, right? That has to be a mistake. If you see the production tab, that's two Twilight Councils on the way. There's no shot. No shot. Okay, okay, he cancels, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, thankfully. Uh, one of them finishes, I believe, one of the Twilight Councils was cancelled. We have a Templar Archives on the way instead. Thankfully. I was like, yo, he's not this crazy, right? And we're throwing down a bit of a gateway explosion before the third. It looks like we are setting up for it, though. But we did delay the third base quite heavily in favor of all this tech. Oracle gets across. DRG's in position. Does protect his base. And this looks like Charger Archon does look like charge lots and archons there is no forge bear that in mind there's no forge there's no plus one there's no upgrades so there's not going to be as much longevity to the army of forjumi as he's completely foregoing those upgrades instead of focusing on tech and he's going for an archon drop oh but it is revealed that is brutal high templar does survive archons are on the way Interesting. Um, I'm curious here. I'm really curious the direction that we're going to be taking. Forge gets thrown down. Um, we have seen like this kind of delayed Archon drop go into very a very heavy tech style, go into a longer later game. I'm curious if that's going to be the case for Jumi, as he did delay his Forge, but he still got it. Still did get the Forge, and he has not started Charge. That's why I'm bringing this up, because we have avoided Charge and Blink and any kind of Twilight Council-based upgrade, which means we don't really have a way to be too assertive on the map outside of this drop harass, of course. Which means for Jimmy, he could be looking at turtle up. Could be. Still a one robo though. I'm curious. Archons are getting across the map. They're going to be harassing. Applying some pressure. They do deny some mining time. Adepts, they get into the main. They do get a handful of drones. Uh, two, three drones. Not bad. Not bad at all. There we go. Charge now on the way alongside plus one. And again, like, charge and plus one are 
quite late. They are quite later than normal, I should say. As the Stasis does go up, gets a queen. Does manage to get a queen. Fujimi just building up back at home, only harassing with a handful of units as he's working on that immortal count. The Archon getting low. Oh, a bit of miscontrol, and Archon goes down. That's a brutal loss there for Fujimi. That means he has that much less to harass across the map. Speaking of harassment, DRG, he does manage to get out, move out with some Archons. Archons? With some Roaches. Does my mining time here at the gold. Pretty good value for two Roaches, to be honest. And I'm hoping we didn't lose the second Archon as well. Uh-oh. Because uh, there is no Archon in that war prism. That is... No, we lost the second Archon! Uh, even the Observer points it out. Oh, that, uh, that is brutal. Those are expensive losses for Jimmy. So the second Archon did go down. I guess for Jimmy was a little bit distracted by the Roach counter attack. We're getting to Storm. Again, working on a later army. A later form of tech. And DRG is looking quite solid. Like, we've been focusing a lot on, like, what Fort Jimmy is up to. But this entire time, DRG has been droning, getting his fourth base, getting up to 64 workers. This is three-base saturation. And now he's focusing on maxing out on Ling Bane, Roach Ravager. DRG, he's about to max out. He's almost there. Like, DRG, he's had a pretty comfortable time here. And we're entering a really similar scenario where... I don't know how Fujimi can move out. I don't know how he can be active. The army is going to be denying any kind of mining at the gold. Lings, they hit the fourth. And they do force a cancel. They should force a cancel. And I'm hoping it was. Hoping it wasn't a kill. As the base is going to be rebuilt. Storm is still on the way. And we do manage to throw down some force fields. The Rich Ravager pushing on forward though. Getting on top of the army. You get some Zealots, nothing major. Zealots gonna be going down. And what's important is that we're containing for Jimmy here to three bases. Big storm on the army. But we're breaking on through nonetheless. There's just not enough here to hold on. Archons are going down. The immortals are exposed. And there's no shield battery. There's no overcharge. And we do manage to get the immortals. With these reinforcements, it looks like DRG should be cleaned up. It's going to be close as well as they connect in the mineral line. 13 probes go down. And yeah, we still have too much for a Travager. Too much of an army. Lings ain't get here just in time. And uh, for Jimmy, he gets broken before he can really get going. Again, I'm pretty sure for Jimmy was working on a on a longer later game. He was still trying to build up on three and four bases. GG gets called. And DRG takes the 2-0, tying up the series 2-2. Two to two. GG. Again, before for Jimmy could really hit his stride, he was cut off at the knees. He was stopped before he could really get things underway and. GG well played. Just a really solid game there out of DRG. Looking quite comfortable. Um, basically, for Jimmy was putting a lot of onus on the Archon Harass, I feel. Like, the Archon Harass needs to do a little bit more. Unfortunately, we only got a handful of drones. We lost the Archons as well. And, yeah, DRG he was able to freely just get up to 66 workers, 66 drones, get up to four bases, and just max out on Roach Ravager. And, uh, and, yeah, just never allowed for Jimmy to expand. And also caught for Jimmy out, out in between the bases and did punish him. GG, well played. Just solid games there out of DRG. And now we're getting ready for our final best of two. It all comes down to this. It all comes down to Quanta versus Honmono. And I'll be honest, I feel like these two are more closely skilled than some of these other matchups. It is going to come down to the CVT. I would give the edge to Honmono though. If you remember at the start of the series, I was talking about how there was a time where Honmono, Quanta, Jinyo, Percival, they were all relatively equal in skill. They were all kind of rising through the ranks, competing in Code A, competing in, in the Korean scene. But um, in the most recent year, maybe I would say the most recent six months, Honmono has really come into his own. He has been improving so much, getting better and better, getting better results in online tournaments, in weeklies. And he has been improving quite a lot. Quanta, if you remember, did kind of retire. He kind of stepped away from the game. He was he stopped being as active as he as he used to be, as he was back in 2020 and 2021. And uh 
has come back to the game, has come back to competing, especially for Club NV, of course. But um, I do think that nowadays he's a little bit more in the shadow of Honmono. But um, we'll see. We'll see if Quanta comes in with something special prepared. I want to believe. I do. As sporting in the bottom right-hand corner of a Golden Aura, we have Quanta for Club Envy. And in the top left, we have his opponent, we have Hon Waifu for Hyperbrook. Uh, <laughs> I'm catching up in the chat. Homeowner was cosplaying Japanese schoolgirl yesterday on stream. Again? Uh, that is not the first time. <laughs> Hon Mono, aka Hon Waifu, um, is an interesting guy. Uh, recently, I think it was a week ago. I think it was around a week ago, maybe more than a week ago. Uh, Homono did end up getting a school and a Japanese schoolgirl uh, cosplay outfits and um, look, <laughs> I, look. Be careful what you tune into on Twitch, okay? Be careful of his of his stream. Uh, it isn't just that Homono has been cosplaying as a as an as an anime girl, um, as a as an anime schoolgirl, but. But he even went as far as to get a voice filter. A uh, homeowner on stream, he has a voice filter to be a, a, kaiwa, a kawaii uwu anime girl as well. Um, will make your dreams come true. <laughs> Check out homeowner's stream. He's an animal, pop. He's an animal. Sometimes he's homeowner. Sometimes he's hon waifu. Oh, oh no, not like this. <laughs> I need to watch. You don't need to watch that. You know. Oh no. <laughs> It's, the internet has gone too far, Pop. He's gone too far. Um, he's got a wig as well. You know, he, he wears a wig. I, he pulls it off quite nicely, that I will say. No? A solid Hon Waifu. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> Shaking my head. I think, I, think, um, I think his team owner put him up to it. I think, I think it's Hyper One's fault. I blame Hyper One, 100%. It is all Hyper One's fault. Uh, and yes, there's the link in the chat. Yes, twitch.tv slash uh, honmono9 if you if you want to enjoy some uh, some anime waifu content. I'm shaking my head. <laughs> Slander, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hyper ones for 100%, 100%. <laughs> you allowed this to happen, pop. You allowed this to happen. What have you done? Under your watch, what have you done to Honmono? <laughs> Uh, cute kawaii Japanese girl slay. Occasional breaking into dancing while doing 4x. Oh, God. Uh, anyway. <laughs> you know what? I would not be surprised if Homono is wearing that schoolgirl outfit right now. You know, just, just for luck. Just for luck. Plays his best. As of for now, we're getting into our openers, getting into our builds. We do have Quanta moving out with his first two Reapers. Is going to be threatening the natural base. With the arrival of the Hellion, Homono, he should be okay. Should be able to fend this off and preserve his SCV. As I say that, Quanta shoots first. Quanta does shoot first. Does take down the SCV. Gets the Reaper as well. Very good trades here by Quanta. Nice foot as well. Does avoid the splash damage. And he gets the Reaper. It's going to be close. He does get the Reaper in the end. Sorry, he does get the Hellion in the end. Very nicely done by Quanta. We'll pull back. Oh, has to respect the reinforcements by Homono. Homono bleeds out two of these SCVs, does delay the CC on the low ground. And now the momentum does swing in favor of Homono. Does go for his own counterattack. And can he delay the bases here of Quanta? Uh, we're getting into marine productions. Looks like we will. Ah, but the command center does complete just in time. And Quanta has a nice little lead. Does have a nice lead for himself. He doesn't have control of the natural, unfortunately, but it is morphing into an orbital, and the tank has arrived. Quanta, he will force this back. He will defend his natural. Shuts down the Reaper, shuts down the Hellion. Good defense here by Quanta. Even following it up with a drop, as the medevac has arrived. Oh, Homeowner, he doubled down on Reaper Hellion production, and so far it has not been worth it. Again, you wouldn't invest this hard unless you wanted to get to break into the mineral line and go for some SEVs. The drop is spotted at least. Is spotted. Homono, he knows he's getting ready back at home. Whew. As we're getting into our 1-1-1 one, one, one setup. Homono investing into Vikings, not Medivacs. Is heavily investing into those Vikings. Is in position for that drop. At the same time, gets into the mineral line, gets an SEV. Well, the Medivac gets low. Oh, gets one shot away from going down. But it will survive. 
As the dust does settle, I do want to give the edge to Quanta here. He at least does preserve his units. Cleans up all the Reapers and Hellions. Does maintain a worker lead. So far, looking solid. But it is a slight advantage and a slight lead. Again, it's TVT, and a lot of this is still very positional based. You can have slight army supply leads, and ah, the reality is that if you, if you get caught out, if your opponent is the first to siege, if you are out positioned, then it can all be for naught. Especially with the Viking advantage that Honmono has. A big part of TVT is air control. Again, tanks, they can shoot further than they can see. As a result, air control is a big part of that, of just extending that range, extending that vision. Bullying back the army. The medevac is repaired. We're going for a drop. As the drop moves out, Homono is committing. Uh, but he's being caught out. The tanks, they do siege. They do siege in time. Remember, Homono still has that Viking lead, but the drop does manage to get out across the map. And Homono is in position. Do we have anything to defend? He's supply blocked. Oh, now is not the time. Vikings are on the way. We get into the mineral line. SCVs are going to go down. We get one, we get two. We get a third SCV in. Can we get the tank? We do get a mass repair in the tank. It barely does survive. At the same time, who sees us first? The Vikings land. The boys are being pulled. And Quanta, good target firing, does focus on the tanks. Bleeds out four workers, but he will hold. Uh, does overextend with his Vikings, but regardless, he will hold on. And the drop has still not been cleaned up. Get another Marine. Well, it looks like the medevac is going to be hunted down. But Quanta still up in workers. And on top of that, the third CC is on the way. It is almost done. A big lead here for Quanta. As he's finishing his third, Homonos is just now starting. But it is on location. And on top of that, Homono does have map control. So the goal here for Homono is to delay the third base of Quanta for as long as he can to contain Quanta as best as possible. As much as possible. He's moving out. Going to be clashing with the main army. Who sieges first? Show us the fight. Up. Oh! The armies they do clash. No one sieges. It looks like the Viking fights are barely in favor of Quanta. Just barely. Ah, but we have reinforcements. And Quanta, he gets caught out. Please, out of Viking. The tanks, they siege up on the high ground. Quanta forced back. Hoboto maintaining his Viking control. His air control. Air superiority. Scan reveals that the orbital is already being landed on location. And Hoboto's own third base is just now finishing as a regular command center. But again, these are still slight advantages. You can see that Quanta is only up two workers. The third base is going to give him quite a boost to his economy, though. That is a, a big power spike for him in that worker count and the mules. As for the first time in a while, Quanta is pushing with his main army. I'm not so sure if I'm fond of this because, again, like, he does have the Viking deficit, so he can't win this fight. Yeah, Vikings are going to be going down for Quanta. Big overextension. Like, again, we knew that we were down in Vikings, and oh, we land on top of the tanks! Honmono, he catches out the tanks. Two of them go down. Big catch here from Honmono. Very nicely done. And Honmono, that was a big win for him. Two tanks getting the Vikings as well. And he may just snowball out of control. One mistake too many for Quanta. And can Honmono be stopped? He's moving out with everything he has. Will never allow those Vikings to lift up. The boys, they're being pulled. They have to be. We land the Vikings. The SVs are just melting here, and it looks like Homono is snowballing out of control. He cleans up the ground army. Shuts down 18 SVs, the Vikings, and the tanks. And this is looking like the beginning of the end here, or at least the previous fight was. You can see how quickly things can swing in your favor. It was all on a knife's edge. We scan, we confirm that homeowner, he's on three bases. He's chasing down that third TC as well. A uh, homeowner, his tanks are a little bit exposed. We can maybe try to take advantage of that. But again, like outside of a big mistake, homeowner, he has a massive lead and he's not going to let it go. 
Quanta, he does catch some of these Vikings. Does land, takes down another. Nice catch here by Quanta. Aware that homeowner was split up. Getting another Viking. Not bad. Going for the tanks as well. Ah, oh, but they are sieged. Yeah, we don't quite go for the land. Another tank from homeowner goes down. Nice little pickups here by Quanta. Still not enough to bounce back, but he's clawing his way back in. We can see Quanta making five Vikings at a time. Jesus. It's a lot of Vikings. And with that, he could try to shut this down. It's not going to be pretty, but we could try to spit out those Vikings and land on all these tanks. It's tempting. It is tempting. And he goes for it. There we go. It does go for the land. Takes down three of those tanks. Does take a couple of volleys to the face, but that was an efficient trade here by Quanta. Does shut Homono down. And on top of that, Quanta, he saves a third TC. Does save it. The downside is that Homono, he's got a massive economic lead. He's already got his third. Now he's got a fourth base up and running. He's up to 76 workers. He's up 30 SEVs. And even though Homono did lose a bunch of tanks, he still has the army supply lead as well. It is still not enough for Quanta to bounce back. It was a nice catch, don't get me wrong. Like, it was, it was good pickoffs. Good couple of moments for Quanta. Still not enough. We need more, is what I'm getting at. We do need more. And if he's able to drag Homono out of position, if he's able to catch another portion of Vikings, maybe Quanta can pull this off. Uh, as it is mech versus mech. <laughs> I said at the time, at the start of the series, like, I wouldn't be surprised if Quanta plays mech. I wasn't ready for, uh, for Homono to embrace the mech as well. I wasn't quite ready for that. But Homono just taking it slow and steady. It's 4CC getting up and running. Look at it max out. Like, there's nothing pressuring Homono... Like, to move out right now. May as well just max out first, secure your win, secure your army, and then push. Otherwise, you might give Quanta an opportunity to, to, to recover. Cyclone gets a Viking. Uh, trades for a Viking. Not ideal. Homono is pushing in. He does have the Viking lead, or at least I assume so. 23 versus 25. The homeowner with a sly viking lead is breaking through, has Slycons to support as well. And he should come out on top here in this fight. And tanks are going to be sieging. No, never mind. Quanta does force back the army. He holds. Gets dragged into the Widowmine. Uh, and we can see homeowner just shell away at that fourth. Throws down the mule to repair. Tops up that tank. And Quanta with the defender's advantage, he was barely able to come out on top with his Vikings. But his fourth is denied. Homeowner, he maintains his lead. It could be that Hon, Hon Waifu is related to Dragon. Oh. Oh, no. Not like this. <laughs> the memories have flooded back. We don't have to, we don't have to talk about Dragon. It's fine. <laughs> Ay, ay, ay. He's not quite at that level. He's not. He's not that degenerate. I, <laughs> you're not gonna see Hon Waifu like 69ing a chair, okay? That's that's. He's not there yet. If he does, though, it's Hyper One's fault, 100%. <laughs> if that does happen, we know who to blame. Uh, as, <laughs> as we are. As we do see Quanta at least holding onto his fourth base location, forces back the army. Big mind shot goes off. On the Vikings? Not my fault. Copium, copium. <laughs> and someone is able to take a fifth. Able to get up on five bases. Is reinforcing, pushing up the ramp as well. He's got his Vikings stacked, and with that, he does take a more efficient fight. 
Yeah, and it's just a numbers game at this point. Homono is snowballing out of control. GG gets called, and Homono will take game number one. GG. With that, a Hyperberg Esports, um, yeah, Hyperberg, they are one game away from making it on into a Codes qualifying match. They are so close. They can taste it, baby. They can taste it. They are so close to that qualifying spot, to that qualifying match. And that series was pretty back and forth. That game was very back and forth. It was very close as well. We saw that things very quickly swung in Honomono's favor when Quanta overextended. Remember, he knew that he had the Viking deficit, but he moved out anyway. He moved out, I think it was like with three tanks. He moved out with three tanks, with like four Vikings, a handful of SCVs, and Quanta overextended on Honomono's side of the map, despite the fact that he was ahead in SCVs, ahead in economy. And Quanta, he threw that away, he overextended, he lost his Vikings, lost his tanks, and immediately Homono counterattacked and punished Quanta for that, for that push. Very well done. Again, you can see just how much on a knife's edge games can be on Golden Aura. And the rush distance by ground is quite short. It's quite short, doesn't... As, oh, here we go, we're getting to game number two and spawning in the top left-hand corner, we have Quanta for Club Envy. And in the bottom right, we have a Team Hyperberg, Hon Mono. Here we go. The TVT does continue. The pressure is on again. If Quanta can win this game, we can force the ace match. Otherwise, it could all be over if Hon Mono takes the win here and now. G DRG would be the favorite in the ace. He would be. He would be. What I should emphasize, if we do get to the ace match, is that the ace match is a best of one. Anything can happen in a best of one. Like I would say that DRG would be the favorite player, 100%, but it is no guarantee and... I, it's it's gonna get wild. <laughs> it's gonna get wild, Bobby. It's gonna get wild. Oh. But we're not quite there yet. We can see both our players opening up double gas. It's gonna be double gas openers. Gonna be leading into a factory, into a racks followed by a factory, into delayed command centers. So very safe builds here from our players. This would shut down Proxy Reaper, for example, if either one went for Proxy Two Rax Reaper. It's just a safe way to play here. And of course, a little bit more aggressive as well. As you do get into your factory production. The first deviation here is that Quanta is going out with his SCV scout. That technically means that on the one hand, Quanta will have some scouting information. On the downside, Quanta will be taking a slight economic deficit as Homono keeps all of his workers mining. SCV comes in, we get eyes on the factory, we confirm there is no proxy, there is no cheese. We do confirm the opener as Quanta races back home. To make sure he doesn't get caught out by the Reaper. He is racing back home. Reapers are on the way, they've hit the field. Interesting, it's going to be Reaper into Reactor for Honmono. Once again, if you remember in game one, Honmono did open up Reactor to Reaper Hellion. Was quite aggressive with it. Wasn't too successful with his Reaper Hellion aggression, but we could see that again here from Honmono if he doesn't go for the add-on swap. Reaper dips in, gets eyes on the add-on, on the tech lab. Oh, but he gets caught out! Does get caught out. Honmono does shoot first. He's chasing down the Reaper, and he should shut it down. Big pick off there by Honmono. Does get the Reaper. And that is scary. That is one less Reaper to defend. And every unit counts here in the early game as Homono is once again going Reacted Reaper Hellion. A very aggressive style here. Depending on how hard he commits and how many Reapers and Hellions he makes. Meanwhile, back at home, Quanza going for a Cyclone. A very safe way to open up. Much more defensive position here from the blue, from the blue Terran. But again, he is down that Reaper. From here, we're going to be going for an add-on swap. Getting our CC on location. Reapers and Hellions are still amassing for Honmono. And he's pushing. With that add-on swap, we're going for reactor Cyclone production. Okay. This is a good way to shut down this early aggression. Cyclones are a little bit more robust. They can, of course, chase this down. So do pick away at that Hellion. And again, we have another wave of units on the way from Honmono. They're still coming in. We go for the dive. We're going for the Cyclone. First Hellion goes down. We are not able to wall off, and the Cyclone is going to fall. But just in time, two more Cyclones pop out. And with this, Quanta should defend. 
It was a scary moment for him. Did lose a cyclone, but he has two more to take its place. He is holding, going for a drop. Bold move. And the Reapers, they avoid the scout. They avoid the drop. And as Quantum moves out, Homono, he's moving in. He goes straight for the main base. What is it at home to defend? Cyclones are still in production. And SCVs are going down one after the other. Big damage here from Homono. Ay, ay, ay. Again, Quantum missed the Reapers. Seven SCV goes down. Eight SCVs. Nine. Soon to be ten. And maybe even eleven. Oh, God. Eleven workers full. Homono takes a massive worker advantage. And Quanta, the pressure is on to counterattack. We gotta go. But we have a tank to defend. We have a bunker on the way. We have a tank in production as well. Second tank on the horizon. As long as we're able to defend against a counterattack, Homono, he's he has a massive lead. He's in the driver's seat right now. We just have to survive. Quanta going for the double drop into the natural. The tank is in the main, so the natural is exposed. We can get some damage done here. Vikings, they zone back that medevac. Ah, we only get one SCV. Not good enough. And things are looking quite a bit dire here for Quanta. Yeah, he's moving out with everything he has. He's going mass cyclone raven. So the way this works, I believe he has disable. I believe. Um, if he does have it, he can disable the tanks. If he disables the tanks, his cyclones can snowball out of control. It's all about the ravens. It's all about the disables. Likewise, homeowner, his job here is to zone away those ravens with the vikings. Here we go. As the raven does take a couple of hits already. Good stuff for homeowner. Zoning back the army, being very proactive, actually. And the ravens, they take a lot of hits. And Quanta is being forced back. He's being shut down. The Ravens are barely alive. And these Cyclones, yeah, they're not going to be good enough. Not anymore. The Homono, he knows he has a lead. Quanta at the same time going for a drop towards the main. Homono, he's going for the third. Liberator goes down. Order tarts are thrown down. Quanta desperately trying to hold on. Does shave off those marines. We're down to three tanks. Cyclones, they get into the main. And we're getting SCVs. We get seven. We get seven. We're looking for more. Oh. Really do not. The Ravens are targeted down one after the other. The tanks are snowballing out of control. No! The Cyclones go down. The drop does get targeted. And Hon Mono, he can focus across the map. He can focus on this third, pushing even into the natural. And Quanta, he's up against the wall. He's up against the ropes. We were talking about the potential ace match. But it looks like it may not happen. Quanta, he's holding, but he loses another seven workers. And he just cannot afford that. He was already at an economic deficit. And uh, alas, it will stay that way. At least Quanta has a third base. He has triple mules available. True. Just have the mules. Quanta getting to mech once again. So is Hon Mono. It's going to be mech versus mech. And Hon Mono is pushing towards that third. He wants to at least. The Vikings are on a mission. Bobbing and weaving, weaving their way into the main. You know, the third base of Hon Mono has been spotted, has been scouted. Vikings, they drop into the main base. They're getting some SCVs. Not too bad. Good kiting here from Quanta. But he will lose both of these Vikings. <laughs> Being cute with his micro here, but he's going to get shut down. And here comes the Cat Harass from Hon Mono. You have a Viking in the natural, four Vikings in the main. Quanta, he's just trying to recover. He's just trying to make SCVs. That's all he wants. As we deny, deny any kind of mining in the main, we focus down the tank as well. Big pick up. Tank does fall. But we will clean this up. As Homeowner, he gets another SCV. 
And now we have three base versus three base. Three orbitals as well. Three with players. We can see that Quanta, he has dragged himself back into this, thanks to his harassment. I would still give the edge to Homono, but Quanta, he's still in this game. He's looking to stabilize. He's looking to stabilize. Since his tower has completed, once again, Homono going for another Viking drop. Going for another Viking flyby. There is a Rax in position, though, to scout. Homono is forced back. Ooh, and we have a game. Okay. <laughs> After a very tense back and forth early game here, we're calming things down. And we are going to be settling into four bases. Quanta, meanwhile, is pushing through the center. And he may be able to deny that fourth. Does have eyes on it. Does get eyes on the fourth CC. Tanks are getting in position. So is Quanta. But the tanks are sieged. Homeowner does have the Viking lead. Ooh, he shuts down the Vikings one after the other. I'm getting deja vu. This has happened before. The Vikings go down, and now we can land on the tanks. As we chase down even more of these Vikings. Homeowner maintaining his air control. Quanta does at least survive with his tanks. He does get away. But what was that? Like six Vikings just went down. Seven even. A oh, brutal loss there for Quanta, and I don't know how he's able to gonna how he's gonna be able to gain map control, gain air control away from Honmono. Force to pull back. Missile turrets are on the way. I mean they have to be. Thankfully, Vikings don't shoot down. As Honmono, he's skirting around the edge. Can he make his way up the ramp? Does he first? Does siege up. Tankful is going to be going off. We do have the high ground for Quanta. Yeah, Homeowner is running out of tanks. Down to one. The Vikings, they will land. They go for the mineral line. And we annihilate a line of SCVs. 11, 12 workers going to be going down and counting. And even though the tanks may not have broken through, the Vikings did. 28 SCVs go down. Oh my god. We annihilate the mineral line, and from here we can just keep on going. Again, it's going to be so difficult for Quanta to ever build up a Viking count comparable to what Homono has. He's getting into Cyclones to help out. We're going for the Orbitals. And once again, the Viking count is being reset. Take down two of them. And Homono, he's chilling back at home. He's on 82 workers. Almost double the worker counts. Almost double the supply. We've got two more CCs on the way in. Yeah, Homono just looking so comfortable here. And again, barring like an overextension and Homono making a big mistake. He is poised to take this. Quanta up. Trying to get under them with his Cyclones. Unable to. Still has a siege line at least. Has his tanks in position. Oh, we have offensive turrets being thrown down here on the front lines. Honmono containing his opponent to three bases. Not allowing him to expand. Not allowing him to break out. So even if we were somehow able to build up a Viking count, we have... It's hard to fall back to. Do you have those turrets? Cyclones that get shut down by the tanks. Homeowner was in position. Did leave tanks at home. Quanta is getting into Thor production, which I do appreciate. I do like this. It's a good way to support your air army and to fight back against a higher Viking count. That is true. But the Thors have to get within range. Easier said than done. As see Hold Mono just mass scanning, looking for a fourth. Speaking of, Quanta is trying to sink out that fourth base as an orbital. Is on the way. I believe Hold Mono didn't miss it. Did not see, doesn't know. He's in position to deny the linear fourth. 
At least the fourth on the right hand side, not towards the left. We'll see if 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 Quanta can get this base up and running, then maybe he can max out. It's still gonna be a, an uphill battle, but we'll have a chance. Thor gets a couple of hits in. Thor gets two shots off. The base is getting up. Quanta getting in position as well. Homono just now about to check. Ah, but it's too late. Turrets are finishing. Quanta, he has a chance if he can maintain this base. The homeowner, he's coming in with his army. You can see him rotating on the minimap. Ooh, does run into some tanks. Does run into them. Quanta, now he's going to be fighting only half the army. Thor putting in a lot of work as well. And Quanta, he chases back these Vikings. I think he may just barely win out on this fight as well. We need the Thor. Get in there, Bobby. The Thor a little bit too far back. Oof. Yeah, he can't get close. The Thor goes down. And it looks like Quanta, he will come out ahead here in these in this Viking fight. And he, he can even land on top of the tanks. Quanta. We can do it, Bobby. We can do it. Oh, as I say that, we're getting into battle cruisers. <laughs> I was wondering, but that's the reason why we fell behind in Vikings, because we're working towards BCs instead. Homeowner rallying into his death. Bit of a miss rally there by Homeowner. Has to be careful. Does have to be careful. We have a fusion core on the way for Quanta, but uh, the reality is that Homeowner is going to get into those BCs first. And Battle Cruisers, that is the late game of TVT. That is the ideal. That's what you want. Liberator has arrived. I mean, Quanta does have air control. Gets a tank. Quanta is fighting back. And because of all the Vikings, like, Quanta, he does have an answer to these BCs. Like, the BCs, they don't really get dominant until we're able to build up a, a an insane amount of them. With, like, you know, 8, 9, 10 battlecruisers. Yamato as well. It takes a while. It does take a while to really get that going. The ace match, the dream ace match, it's still there. It's still, it's still alive. It's still a possibility. Oh, Liberator's within range of the turret. That is brutal. Tank goes down, but so does the Lib. Battle cruisers are moving out. Now, thankfully, because homeowner is moving out with the BCs, they will be able to teleport back home. We should not lose them. They should be safe. The BCs, they are going to be skirting around the edge. They do get spotted. Uh, they're spotted, but the Vikings are out of position. SCVs are going to go down. We get four workers. We get some tanks, and we teleport the hell out of there. Good trade for Hon Mono. Efficient pickoff. Meanwhile, Quanta's getting into his own Yamato, getting into his own BCs. He's working towards it. Until then, two more battle cruisers on the right hand side. Oh, homeowner, he has maxed out. Quanta, can we survive long enough to max out ourselves? We'll see. It's not going to be easy. Homeowner, he just has a massive ground army alongside his Vikings. Tanks are pushing in. Yeah, the Vikings, they do clash. Big anti arm missile. We do get the missile on the Vikings. with the BCs, they tank so many shots. Yeah, we have to kite back. We get one BC. We get one. We can get the other as well. But Quanta is being forced further and further back. And Honomono, it looks like he has too much. He's breaking on through, getting on top of the third base. Ah, Quanta, he had almost recovered. Or oh, he... He had a road to victory there, but GG gets called. Hon Mono gets into his battle cruisers. He will take the series 2-0, to zero and he will win it all for Team Hyperberg. GG. GG, well played. Congratulations to Hyperberg for advancing on into a qualifying match to, to make it into WTL Codes. GG, well played. My condolences to Club NV. 
It was a tense TVT between Quanta and Honmono. DRG, he put in the work. He was able to look dominant versus for Jumi. Mono did struggle against Special, and the reality is that Club NV were missing one of their key players, if not their strongest players, they were missing Creator tonight. Unfortunately, without Creator, Club NV could not advance on. Honestly, Club NV were poised to qualify. They were one of the favorites to make a deep run and to make it into Code S. But today was a crucial day. We needed our A team. We needed our ace player. Unfortunately, Creator wasn't able to be here tonight, and Club NV does fall. GG, well played. My condolences here to Club NV, but a shout out to Hyperberg as they do advance on, and you can see tomorrow's matches. Let's go, puppy. Let's go. Tomorrow's matches, we have the upper bracket finals between Berserker Esports and Twisted Fairy. As a reminder, Berserker and Twisted Fairy, they've already qualified for Code S, and that is followed by Offside versus Hyperberg. There's four teams and only three spots, only three Code S spots. Who's it going to be? Offside or Hyperberg? Tune in tomorrow to find out. Um, I do realize that we are the only English stream tonight, which is unfortunate. Um, but I'm sure tomorrow, you know, Rotterdam or Wardy or, you know, maybe there's going to be another English stream out there. I think Wardy wasn't casting today because of... Um, I think Wardy is covering EPT. I think he's covering EPT Spring. So he was unable to cast WTL. Uh, so depending on the schedule tomorrow, that could be the same case, or maybe he'll be able to uh, enjoy some World Team League action. Uh, regardless, we will be there. Regardless, we will be there here. The Cranky Ducklings, as always, Poppy, as always. So if you enjoyed the broadcast, if you want some more Cranky Duckling action covering WTL, give us a follow. Give us a follow here on Twitch or maybe on YouTube. We're streaming on both platforms at the same time. And likewise, our VODs are uploaded to YouTube on a daily basis. Plenty of content on YouTube. Um, a big shout out to Rainer. Rainer did rate us earlier. And I'm sure there's many people that are tuning in for the first time. I'm sure there's many people that maybe have not watched us here. But we are the Cranky Ducklings. We've been casting full time since COVID, since 2020. So it's been a couple of years. And uh, we cast on a daily basis multiple times a day. For example, today we had three broadcasts. Three, we had three broadcasts here today. We had KSL, followed by Sea Duckling Open, followed by WTL. Tomorrow is another big day of StarCraft. Our next broadcast is going to be in less than 24 hours. We're going to be hosting our own tournament, the Sparkling Tuna Cup, here on the Cranky Ducklings, followed by day six of World Team League. So back to back, two broadcasts tomorrow. Tune in. Tune in. If you're wondering, Sparkling Tuna Cup? What? What? What's going on? The Tuna. Yes. The Tuna, Bobby. The Dong one, if you will. Uh, it is an open tournament that we host here on the channel. It is open to all regions. So we have players from Europe, from Korea, from Southeast Asia, from the Americas, all tuning in, all competing in our open tournaments. So if you're interested, we got you covered there. Um, it is going to be in, Jesus, how many hours time? Let me just double check that. We are going to be live in... 18 hours. In 18 hours' time, we're going to be live with the Sparkly Tuna Cup. So mark your calendar, set your alarms. We'll be back. <laughs> Otherwise, thank you for watching. Thank you so much for the support. Um, if you are unsatiated, if you want some more StarCraft, then I believe EPT Spring is currently live. So uh, we may as well raid. Um, I believe Rotterdam is also casting uh, EPT as well. Uh, he's co-streaming. That's it. He's co-streaming uh, ESL Pro Tour. Um, Christiana is up against Showtime at the moment. One at the very end. There you go. <laughs> is up against Showtime. And we may as well rate. May as well uh, give Roddy some love and support. Um, so you can head on over there and tune in for some more StarCraft. Otherwise, thank you for watching. Thank you for the support. We do appreciate it. We'll be back tomorrow. If you want to follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Discord. All things Cranky Ducklings. All things all over the internet. Tune in. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks so much for the support. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye, puppy guy. Bye. Hasta luego. Ciao.